Good evening, and welcome to the uh, select board meeting of December 18th. Uh, I'm calling this meeting order at 6.32 p.m. Um, we'll start with opening remarks, announcements, and agenda review. I don't have any announcements there. Oh, actually, I do have an announcement as far as agenda review, um, which I'll take up under, um, well, it could be under nine topics, chair not reasonably anticipate, or under member reports. Um, and that will be with regard to uh, whether we want to send a letter relative to funding for the uh, shelter. And so we'll take that up later. I just want to mention it to you all. Um, <coughs> there was one other thing, and that was uh, we had a request from Amherst, New York, that we send uh, something, to, and I think that we probably should take that up as uh, un unanticipated. Okay. So hopefully we'll remember that Thank you for a few hours from now. <laughs> Um, and if not, then uh, we'll start with public comment. Is there anyone here for public comment, which would be things not on the agenda. Things on the agenda, we'll seek out your comments at those times, but either of you, I assume, are here for other things later on? Okay. So then uh, we'll get into our agenda proper. Um, we'll start with our action and discussion items, and the first thing is the uh, Municipal Property Uses and Disposition Process Policy Review. So Mr. Zomek, will you join us? And we saw this. 13th of November, I believe. So if you want to kind of refresh our memory and. Sure, good evening. Happy to be here with you tonight to talk about um, the surplus real property um, policy and process that we outlined with the board uh, briefly on November 11th. I think in the packet or in your previous packet, you have now have two memos for me on, on November 11th. Um, this was a meeting before town meeting, so it was uh, one of your abbreviated meetings, if you will. Um, but we did have uh, a pretty thorough discussion of the outline that I provided with you on that date. And then um, since that time, I have had an opportunity to meet with a number of department heads as a group. Uh, in fact, we got together the department heads listed uh, in my November 11th uh, memo and got some more feedback from them. They are um, supportive of, of my work to work with you and the town manager on this surplus real property policy, and they stand um, ready to assist any way uh, that the board would like to move forward. I think um, I saw tonight, uh, I know you have a full agenda, so I'll be brief, but I saw it tonight as an opportunity to take in more of your questions and comments. Um, I have been in regular contact, shall we say, with Sharon Everett from Coleman and Page. She assisted with the original memo and we're, we're going back and forth as staff and working with the town manager as questions come up. I'm kind of hitting her with those. I will say that one of the most interesting and um, um, fluid uh, discussions is really how will the town work with our, our close partner, the Municipal Affordable Housing Trust, if you decide to move forward with this. And we probably don't have time to go into detail on that tonight, but suffice it to say that we're having ongoing conversations about that. And uh, we think that um, that is a relationship that um, has great promise as they work to develop more affordable housing in the town of Amherst. Um, so happy to go through my little bulleted list of questions, if that would be helpful. Um, I think I can roll through those mm -hmm. fairly quickly. Um, and these, uh, a couple of these came up at the November 11th discussion, and then a couple were <coughs> offered by department heads. So very quickly, um, uh, the first question about the town of Littleton, um, it is required of any town to um, bring, uh, transfer a disposition of municipal land through town meeting. So the answer there is yes. Um, the second question is a little more nuanced, and really I'm looking for more feedback on this from you. Um, Ms. Brewer brought this up um, on the 11th. Uh, I, I think really it speaks to the composition of the advisory group. Is the select board comfortable with the advisory group beginning the process, doing the inventory uh, and those early steps in the process? Would the select board um, like to have a representative on that group? or how strongly do you feel that there should be representation from other boards and committees? Um, so I think we, we can come back to that um, because that's, a, that's probably something you, you'd like to get a little deeper into. Um, 
The third question, what if the select board does not recommend disposition of a parcel? And I've talked to Sherwin Everett, it's fairly simple. I mean, it simply goes back into the, the list, into the inventory. And for some reason at that time, at that moment in time, um, the select board may say, you know what, we're not ready to dispose of or transfer that piece of property. And it simply stays with the town uh, for another day, for another review in the future. Um, there's really no harm, no foul there. Um, it just may not be the right time to transfer or surplus that property. Um, we do own land in other towns, so clearly the the second, or excuse me, uh, question um, four and five were brought up by department heads. We do own uh, land in other towns. That is, uh, as you know, principally water supply or watershed protection land for either wells or reservoirs. Um, and um, Believe it or not, there are some parcels that were acquired many, many years ago that frankly may, upon further study and the, the, the precise mapping we can do today, may not be essential for water supply or watershed protection. It's not a lot of land. I don't want to get anyone out there in other towns or, or uh, within the town worried about that. But there are a couple of outlying parcels that were perhaps given to the town and really do not contribute to water supply or watershed protection. Some of them may, and the last question was about Article 97. You're probably familiar with Article 97 that protects um, con conservation land and recreation land. So that last question would really be dealt with as part of the review, the review that staff would do and present to the town manager who would bring to the select board. In that review, it would list what encumbrances may come with parcel A or parcel B. Um, is it protected by Article 97? Should it, uh, should it move through the process? How would we um, address the issue of Article 97? Again, that's, there's not a lot of these parcels. We're not talking about transferring or surplusing conservation land or extensive watershed lands or anything of the sort. So some of these questions are fairly easy. I think the more complex one is really the composition of the advisory group, and, and I'm curious and, and open to your suggestions about the composition of that group. And happy to stop there for a moment. Mr. Zimmer. Thank you, Mr. Zomek. Uh, I'll come to that one in a moment, but um, on the last of the five bullets, uh, how do we address Article 97 protections for watershed and recreation parcels? There's one other that I would assume we have to think about, and that is, um, if land was given or sold to us with um, an understanding relating to either a gift or a reduction in price because of an anticipated use, that we would probably need to have the committee make sure that it has looked into whether there are any legal impediments that we need to be aware of. That's, that's a great question, and I was kind of covering that under kind of encumbrances, yes. But if there are gifts with a, with a particular intention back, you know, we've been accepting gifts or buying land for a, a long time in Amherst as many municipalities. So if there were gifts that were given with a particular intent, um, you know, we want to make sure we identify that intent and then address that. It's not unlike, you know, municipalities across the Commonwealth, across the country dealing with art that has been donated to them, et cetera, et cetera. So that's a very good point, thank you. Okay, the second thing is that, uh, just as a matter of uh, stating the obvious, if we're using um, land for one purpose and we, as the town of Amherst, decide to use it for another purpose, that is not surplus property and is not in any way um, involved in this process. For example, if uh, the um, Department of Public Works moved to a building at a different location and we were to use that property for another purpose, that's um, reuse of property within our own purposes. It's not surplus. I just want to point that out. And uh, as far as the question of committees, um, when you talked about um, the real um, property advisory group, and I, um, this is just my own thoughts on it. I said, on the one hand, um, sort of intrigued by the idea of including 
the housing trust there because affordable housing is a major issue of the community, but um, I think that it does need to give some consideration as to why that single committee has been um, sort of focused on and singled out at this point, um, whether that's in fact what we want to do, and as you point out, whether there are any others. I know of other committees um, and boards that have approached us about projects of various kinds that they would like to uh, make sure that there's provision for in the future and uh, how, and of course this is a committee that is going to make that kind of earlier decision that I was referring to about reuse as opposed to sale and um, so I think that uh, we have to just make sure that the the committees are always feel that they're welcome to participate in the process and have room for them to participate in the process. But um, I don't think we can anticipate all of them and include all of them in the, in the process. And, I th and therefore, we do need to have this discussion a little bit more, in my opinion, as a group. Yep, respond, please. Just, um, <coughs> excellent point about reusing land for a different purpose. Um, what I do want to refer to is, for instance, if there were a piece of recreation land, and one might look at certainly some recreation land that we have received in, or uh, currently own in Amherst, either gifted to the town or potentially under Article 97 um, 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 protections. If we were to repurpose that land and move the care, custody, and control from the town manager, to another entity in town, that would need to be addressed under this process. So that is, you would first need to transfer that custody, care, and control from, in this case, recreation land, which is under the uh, uh, um, control of the town manager, to another entity. So, so again, that's that's another another uh, subtle subtle point. On the on the committee itself. Um, I do, I do think there is something, and, and I've been holding pretty fast to, to, this, to this group of, of staff in that I really feel like that, um, that staff can represent in an objective way to have the <coughs> breadth and scope of people that we have around the table there from economic development to planning um, to the assessor to uh, conservation um, around the table. Um, I think we through this process, we create opportunities for the various interests to participate in that process. Um, I did want to uh, uh, throw out one idea that I had about number one on page three, um, actually number two. So obviously if the advisory group put together the inventory um, one idea that I had, and I, I spoke briefly with Mr. Bockelman about, was under number two, when such a determination is made, the advisory group will hold a me public meeting to review the parcel in question. That could be a public meeting that happens during one of your meetings. It could be a public meeting or part of a public hearing within one of the select board meetings, something of that sort, maybe a hybrid of what we're talking about here. So I just offer that up. Uh, because I think Ms. Brewer expressed some concern about having staff initiate a meeting uh, of this importance. So I offer that as one option. Ms. Brewer. Um, thank you, Mr. Zomack and uh, Mr. Steinberg for kind of kicking us off. Um, after listening to Mr. Steinberg, it, it seems to me we need to really, um, in whatever the final document is, define what surplus means. Cause I, um, I think it does apply to a reuse where you're releasing it from one use to change use. It doesn't imply necessarily a sale or a disposition, but that just may be, you know, I interpret it one way, Mr. Steinbrand. So I think when we have to say what, you know, surplus means, and there may be three or four different instances where, um, you know, the common meaning of surplus and what that means in the municipal context could maybe get clarified um 
and you did talk about care, custody, or control. So I think getting some of that maybe language into the into the maybe it's in here, and I just if, don't remember. If I could, yeah, just refer to policy and process on page three, number three, <laughs> that part of our next steps, if if the select board is comfortable with this rough framework, I would I would. Um, offer that we begin to move forward on solidifying some of this, but under number three, it would be incumbent upon the select board, and, and I would work with the town manager on this, to establish a policy um, by which real property would be deemed surplus. So therein is the definition. Right, right. To, to, but to really, I think, needing to drill down a little bit yes. about the different kind of instances. Um, I, when you brought up the sort of uh, nuances of the housing trust, I never actually thought you were s suggesting that they be on this. No, so I think, I, I um, and I, um, the only other group I thought of besides select board is a, as a possible is finance committee, because often they have had an interest in the disposition for revenue re or different reasons, but I'm, I'm kind of of mixed mind. I'm, I'm not sure. Um, that um, you know, elected officials or appointed officials necessarily should be on here, but I would take a little issue, uh, Mr. Zemeck, with saying department heads are impartial because I've worked for department heads and they have their own view. They may not have a, you know, I, I won't go into it, but they're humans and they come from different areas and expertise. And um, I think it's fine for a first cut, but they definitely um, often have a perspective. Maybe I could say that slightly differently. I, <laughs> I'd say the group that we've assembled here um, on page three is a very balanced group <laughs> and that I would offer that if I were facilitating this group bringing recommendations to you, I certainly would try to bring a very balanced recommendation to you based on the inventory and based on the characteristics and encumbrances and all of the factors that we've outlined in this, bring that through the town manager to it, you. It, and it would be a very transparent process. So we, early on, we would be able to identify if there were any leanings that um, were too far one way or the other. And then just lastly, and I just had spoken to about this um, earlier this evening, um, when we talk about the inventory of all town-owned real property, which I think should include the other towns if we're going to have that kind of inventory, because they could potentially become, you know, not needed for their original intention. Um, that maybe that inventory can have um, a component that actually, once these are identified tracks, their, their eventual disposition, things get added on and taken off. Because I remember working on um, this kind of inventory 30 years ago, and that's great, but it was a snapshot in time. If we're going to do another snapshot, we could use uh, some of the technology we have to also use it as a, a rolling inventory and keeping track. Oh, well, that was deemed surplus in uh, 2020, and it became this, so that um, it's more of an ongoing movie rather than a snapshot. Again, I think that's a great idea. It really shouldn't be a snapshot in time. It should be almost like a database, and we can look back five years and say, in that five years, you know, we've considered six properties and three of them were surplus, three of them were just determined to not be not ripe, yet. not ripe for whatever reason, and here's what we did. We went mm -hmm. this direction with this one and that direction with another one. Mm -hmm. And then we added this property. It's not. It's on the inventory, it's not surplus, right. but it's just, and we acquired or were gifted, and so it's always got the full list. Really kind of a living document and a living process so people can check in on it and you know, we would have a corresponding map, and we might even, you know, post that and say, here's what, here's what happened done. in 2018, 2019, 2020. The following properties came up, and, you know, they were deemed surplus and, and moved on to X, Y, Z use. So I'll, I'll uh, uh, the Municipal Affordable Housing Trust met last Thursday night. We had a nice little discussion about this. Um, you know, one of the things, and this is partly a, you know the 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 trust itself on you know sort of getting to a place of understanding about what it does and can control you know the trust can own property um and technically that property that it would purchase let's say i mean independent of this but if it went and bought a piece of land for the purpose of affordable housing they hold that but nonetheless the town owns it 
And so, it, you know, any property we have that we might want to use affordable housing, they're going to be, uh, you know, involved in, in that conversation. And, and the level of control is a critical one, and who has it at what points in time are, are critical from the standpoint of development. The thing I think about in a broader sense with this, and it somewhat relates to affordable housing, but not exclusively that, is as we go forward in time. So, you know, I think from a staffing standpoint, yes, I think the staff should own the, the majority share of, of sort of compiling this thing, keeping it going, looking at properties that we own and that sort of thing. But at the same time, that becomes a reference material for other people. So there might be a developer that wants to come in and do something with a proper a piece of property they own and a piece of property the town owns that may not be adjacent to each other in any way, shape, or form, but in combination can create a circumstance that's beneficial and create affordable housing or something else. And those are things that staff are never going to be able to think of. And so I, what I think about is what is the mechanism or do we want to articulate a mechanism for people to bring those to this group, this group of staff. Um, so a mechanism for the public, whether it be a developer or just a a general person, you know, lives in town that wants to offer a suggestion. It's like, what's the mechanism for them to bring something in to be evaluated in a real way, um, which may then require, you know, time of the action to transfer control or control with whatever constraints we choose and that sort of thing. So that's the thing I've been thinking about is as we go forward, we have the inventory in place and we have, you know, we have some really odd little pieces of property here and there in Yon, and there may be somebody that has a really creative, interesting thing that's never going to cross the mind of a staff person because they're thinking of just those properties and they may be putting it in concert with other things. Or, I mean, the likelihood is maybe pretty low for that, but at the same time to have a mechanism for people to come in and offer those suggestions and be evaluated. So it's really just thinking about what's a reasonable way to do that that can be, you know, not a complete, you know, uh, you know, explosion of time necessary by staff to, you know, chase every little detail on these things, but, but certainly an opportunity for, you know, reasonable, rational sort of folks to come in and, and offer a suggestion or want to partner with the town to do something in a way that, you know, uh, they might do now in some ways, but if we had a process that ran through this group so that it could be evaluated a little bit, again, I'm kind of, of I'm not necessarily thinking that we need to have committee membership on this, this group, but it would be through committees that we might be able to then channel those kinds of suggestions to that group, mm -hmm. um, was what I was thinking. But. I could give you a great example from the past that I think Mr. Zemeck knows what. The Wentworth Conservation Area was a partnership with a developer who probably had an option at that point or purchase and sales on a larger piece and wanted, the developer wanted to do an, a mixed income affordable housing ownership project didn't need the whole parcel and the town was able to acquire the conservation land um, to make that that deal work but it was initiated by a, a private entity and resulted in town land and in this case the housing development project is just an example doesn't it right so I, I certainly think we could look at that piece of it I I don't I don't see that as that um, challenging to this process. And in fact, I think once we establish this process and, and there's a public transparent um, order to it um, that would be put out there via the media, by the website, uh, by RFP processes or, or other parts of this process that I think, I think those uh, inquiries will naturally just come and it's, you know, um, honestly, something the planning department does all the time, mm -hmm. um, talking about ideas that people have. Right. Um, but I think but, as long as yeah. we articulate, that's the place to go to sort of mm -hmm. to seek out that, you know, if they're if someone's thinking of some sort of project, where is the place to go? How do they, you know, engage the the start of the conversation is is really the key the key piece, and so even if we just articulate that and in, in here to do what we've always done, which is go talk to the planning department and, you know, offer the suggestion, then I think that's a, that's a good start for that. One thing I haven't had time to do since I met with you on November 11th and, and hope to do it during January is I have not been out to talk with the Conservation Commission, the Planning Board, the uh, Municipal Affordable Housing Trust. I'd like to be able to do that and come back to you with some more direct feedback from them. Um, 
I don't know, say in late January, something like that, uh, at which point I feel like we have, will have kind of done a, a good bit of uh, vetting out there. Um, and my hope would be to try to have this in some pretty solid form, you know, the 1st of February, so that if the select board were comfortable, we could begin doing some inventory work in February. Does that sound like a reasonable timeline? I also brought with me just for, not for discussion tonight, but I did want you to uh, read, as I am reading, uh, the general bylaw article 34, the establishment of the Municipal Affordable Housing Trust, just so you have it in your packet <coughs> tonight. And this <coughs> talks about the broad powers of the trust. And I'm happy to pass that around to you. Did either of you have questions? I didn't want to leave you out. I just going this way around the table. Yes. Well, in that case, Mr. Roth, <laughs> yeah. So, um, as I finally did fumble my memo out from last time, I'm a little concerned about it being presented exactly, I, I'm fine with your presentation, Mr. Zomak, to all those bodies, and I think that'll be great. I'm a little concerned that they, if any of them are as compulsive as I am about checking some of the details on the memo from November, there are some things there that are a little confusing that make more sense now that we've talked about them that I think for them to get, you know, City of Littleton, it makes it sound like they don't have to go to town meeting. Well, of course they have to go to town meeting, but the way it's written, you know, which is, I'm not asking you to rewrite it. I guess I'm just asking you to take it when you do talk to them, take, tell them to take some of the details with a grain of salt, that this is the basic structure and that we'll be fleshing out details. And just like we talked about the variety of ways we might describe surplus and say, well, this kind of thing fits here and this kind of thing fits there. That is also uh, a comment that we made back on the 13th on page five under item 10, where it says such procedures are intended to apply to the sale by the town of its fee interest in property, maybe, but need not apply to disposition of lesser interest. That needs to be somewhere else other than buried in that paragraph, not to rewrite before you go to CONCOM or whatever, but you could even give us an example of this is something we're gonna get we're going to put in a different part of the policy. You know, what, what do you think of that idea? But then I, I don't want them to feel like this is the policy, but that you're, again, just having a conversation with them like you have this structure is handed to them as, you know, this is the base document, we're working on it. Because we just need, I think we just need to clarify some of the things we've been talking about in November and tonight, and we'll be able to do that without, like I said, I would never ask that you rewrite this at this point, but just to caution them that, we've had a lot of conversations since this was written and now the way we read it versus the way we understand it is we're at a different place than we were back when we first we're read evolving. it. It's evolving. <laughs> it is definitely an evolving document. And and I know that one of the things we did talk about too last time I, to, to, spit and to phrase it a different way is whether or not that committee was going to just be staff and we talked about various things associated with that again tonight and I think that makes sense I think a lot of it is in terms of the public trust is in terms of the execution and it's a new thing right so we're going to figure it out but we don't want to be in the position as I pointed out that night of the select board hearing that some other committee had a long discussion about it at a public meeting and then people got all worried about it and we're like wait what we've never even talked about that piece of property but yet there are times you might need to talk to the Conservation Commission first before. So I think it's gonna be, it won't necessarily be smooth every time we do it, but that's okay. And I think that we can just expect that we'll have to smooth off some of the rougher edges as we figure out how to more effectively talk about doing this. I mean, we've been wanting to do it for how long? So mm -hmm. it's not gonna be perfect, but we have a lot to work from here and so, um, We'll probably get some criticism at some point, you know, oh, why are so-and-so talking about it and you never had the trust at the table? It's like, well, we didn't have you at the table yet. That doesn't mean we're not having you at the table at all, you know, that, that sort of thing. And so I, I think that some of that will just be all of us reminding people it's a new process and we're trying to figure it out and we welcome their input, but that no one's going to get cut out of this because it's clear you're going around. So a couple of things um, as follow-up. One is I think the, um, the trust 
the commission, I'm not sure if the planning board, but they have seen this, and I will certainly, when I go out to them, uh, frame it as you have suggested, Ms. Brewer. And, you know, I just want to reiterate that um, my commitment to this process is complete transparency, um, meticulous detail in, in the review, bringing multiple perspectives to that. We have an economic development director. I sit 10 feet away from him. I want Mr. Kravitz to weigh in on these, these discussions because that is a perspective that we haven't always had. And so I welcome his input on looking at a parcel in a different way than I might look at it, or Ms. Brestrup, um, or Mr. Burgess. Um, although I sense Mr. Burgess and Mr. Kravitz <laughs> may be, but anyway. Um, so I, I, I'm committed to, it's a new process. I think we also need to go through it once because we will hit some bumps in the road, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but that's okay. I think as long as we're transparent and inclusive in, in our information gathering and the process we lay out. So I think, you know, with a little more intel and a little more feedback, I could come back to you in late January, but I, you know, my hope would be to get this going in February um, so that we have some of that low hanging fruit. And I think we know a couple of the parcels that we've talked about or have been talked about in public to get that going. Um, and, and we'll put one through the process and we'll learn. And you may say, you know what, Mr. Zomek, you need to adjust that process because there wasn't enough input at the beginning or in the middle or wherever that might be, so. I, I know we're beyond our time, but I just want to note that even though the memo was dated November 11th, which was a Saturday, which I know when you write your memos is on, on the weekends, <laughs> the meeting, if people are looking I'm for sorry. the meeting, is November 13th. That's when the board discussed it. My apologies, yes. And I, and I missed that discussion, so thanks for the recaps. <laughs> So thank you. I apologize for taking more time, um, but I think it's it's a really exciting process, and I will, it, through Mr. Bachelman, I will, uh, if if you are willing uh, to talk back about to more. Us. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Right. Thank you. All right. So, uh, having finished that, it's now just a little after seven o'clock. So I believe we will. We have uh, technically two poll petitions to to deal with. We had a continuation of our poll hearing from last Monday night, which was uh, <coughs> not that we really heard anything other than just to open it for the sake of opening it since we had advertised it as such. And so we'll reopen those public hearings. I don't know that we need to set the time. And so um, in our packet, we have two, we have a memo from uh, Mr. Mooring, uh -huh. correct? Uh -huh. Get to the right part of my packet. And uh, <coughs> there it is. Uh, a memo from the 12th of December, and then do we have folks here from? Yes. So if you want to come up, come yes. forward to our microphone here and and tell us a little bit about those two uh, projects for us. Identify yourself with the microphone for the folks at home because you are on TV. Just to let you know, you can pull two chairs up if you want. Hi, good evening. Uh, my name is Ellen Fryman. I'm an attorney with Shat Schwartz and Fenton in Springfield, and I represent Verizon Wireless. With me is Jay LaTorre, and he is the radio frequency engineer for Verizon Wireless. So do you want to just take us through the location and sort of the sure. purpose? And um, We're here uh, to get uh, permission um, to put antennas on utility poles, which is a new design that's rolling out across the, the state, and it fills in areas, and Jay can speak more to it more specifically, uh, where high traffic areas where more service is needed, but we're able to fill in and create more coverage in a small area with these single antennas that just fit on a utility pole. So Jay, you might want to elaborate a little bit more on that. and. Uh, the two locations that we're looking at are poles located. It's pole 91. It's a Wamiko pole on Southeast Street and um, another Wamiko pole on Prey Street. Sure. Uh, good evening, everyone. Again, my name is Jay Latori. I'm a radio frequency engineer for Verizon Wireless. Uh, as Attorney Fryman mentioned, the technology that we're deploying or proposing to deploy in uh, two areas of the town of Amherst is called small cell technology. Uh, it um, works and seeks to work to take advantage of existing infrastructure to try and uh, rapidly deploy um, additional uh, 
elements of Verizon's wireless network with the goal of enhancing coverage in, generally speaking, a 500 to 1,000 foot radius, hence the word small cell, and also to augment capacity in areas of high demand uh, to keep up with the rapid growth of uh, demand for wireless services that Verizon has experienced since it launched its 4G LTE service in 2010. Um, the two locations, uh, first the location on Prey Street um, is, a, is a great example of rapid expansion, not only of our technologies, but just of the town. Uh, you know, I graduated from UMass Amherst uh, in 2007, and it's amazing to come through Uptown and see all the new developments and apartment complexes. And that little section of Prey Street is a great example of uh, you know, how a town can change and, and how the, uh, our network needs to adapt to that. Um, similarly, in the uh, other example on um, Southeast Street, uh, I think it's Route 9, um, you know, Verizon has identified um, an area where um, there are a number of smaller businesses, gas stations, and places of congregation where um, folks may be likely to be sedentary for a little bit because <coughs> they need to use their phones. And we find that at certain times of the day, um, this can put a strain on our network. And so these utility pole solutions uh, allow us to augment our service. Uh, they're great in that um, they don't uh, require us to make any major ground disturbance or um, you know, have to place a, a new tower up somewhere in town. Um, in these circumstances, uh, we work with the two utilities. In this case, we'd be receiving our power from um, Eversource and our fiber would come from Verizon and uh, have uh, licenses with the two uh, entities to attach to the pole. Uh, construction on these facilities takes only about a day um, and uh, is coordinated between Verizon and the uh, local utilities. And uh, if necessary, depending on um, how we set up the equipment, um, we may require a uh, police detail just to work with traffic with the truck uh, in the road. Um, but that's about it, and we're happy to answer any questions you may have. I just will add a couple, just a couple more things. Um, so it's a canister-like looking antenna, and you have the drawings, and the poles are, uh, Prey Street is a 34-foot uh, pole, and we would be going at the 24-foot uh, level, and the um, Southeast Street, it looks like a 36-foot pole, and we would be going at, looks uh, at 24-foot, so we'd be going about 10 feet. From the top of the from the top of the pole, and I didn't realize till I was starting to do this how much stuff is on utility poles, and um, I don't think anyone would really know about, unless you know it's what it is and it's going to be there that you would even notice that it's there. So, board have questions, Mr. Seinberg? Yeah, I actually do have several things that I wanted to raise. Um, one is that uh, in a similar request previously, we did ask the same question, and that is, is there any equipment that is anticipated to be located within um, reach of the ground um, for, that may be subject to either danger to a person who reaches up towards it or in or, or, or risks vandalism to the equipment? Well, the, the closest equipment that comes to the ground is our service meter, and, and that's installed at approximately it's about five. Uh, five feet above ground. So uh, hypothetically, if from a vandalism standpoint, I suppose if, if someone wanted to smash that off a pole with a baseball bat or something like that, they could. We haven't seen that in the three years that we've <coughs> installed these uh, solutions so far, but that would be the closest thing that I could think of. Um, the service meter is a cutoff switch, basically, so if a utility company needs to work on the pole, uh, they coordinate with Verizon Wireless and can turn off uh, our system and to, well, to work on the pole, and then when they're done, they'll turn it back on. Is there any danger to um, somebody who accidentally touches that, even though they shouldn't, but if they did? The service meter? Yes. Um, I would say no more than, um, you know, 
turning on or off a, a breaker in your electrical panel at home or the main breaker in your house, the same exact concept. Um, it's an enclosed box and it's locked. Um, okay, so I would, safety and liability is one thing that I just wanted to raise. The second thing um, was uh, raised in, uh, we had received a memorandum from Guilford Mooring Superintendent of Public Works in which he said in part, in the event the town continues to underground the utilities in the Triangle Street, Prey Street area, the project would have to accommodate the devices with an acceptable pole and power supply. And I wasn't sure what that meant because it kind of sounded like the town would um, be assuming future liability for the cost if it decided to under the undergrounding further utilities in that area. Uh, it makes sense for the town. And um, so I wanted to clarify what that meant, um, either from Mr. Balcom and from the uh, witnesses. Have you had conversations with Mr. Mooring about that? So we, we've had a couple of conversations with Mr. Mooring in relation to the yeah, uh, Prey Street the installation. Yeah, could you hand that to me, please, sure. Alan? Thank you. Yeah. Um, as you may be aware, we've been working with Mr. Mooring um, extensively over the past six months as Verizon's been building a, uh, a new um, monopole tower at the transfer station uh, down on Route 9. So we've had an opportunity to talk about these projects as well. Um, our specific um, conversations with Mr. Mooring um, on this particular poll on Prey Street were more so focused on some of the current construction. He had pointed out that um, one area uh, where Verizon had seek to pull power from for our facility coming off of East Pleasant Street off a utility pole was gonna be eventually put underground. And so uh, we've already worked out an alternative proposal where we would come off of, I believe it's Triangle Street to bring in power that way. And he had also identified in the area of Prey Street um, a transformer that had been placed on the utility pole that we seek to attach to. Uh, and that was just an oversight on Eversource's part. We've communicated that with them uh, and as part of our installation um, and what they call the make ready process where the utility companies will work on the pole and move the various lines and equipment to make ready our attachment. They'll be taking that transformer down. That's the extent of the conversations that I've had. I unfortunately don't have any formal experience with a, um, you know, we've been doing this for about three years. I don't have any formal experience with utility poles in a large area all be, being taken out with services put underground. My experience is limited to a couple of poles where we've deployed services and then, um, you know, for one reason or another, maybe uh, DOT is doing some sort of road widening or a different type of traffic pattern. And so we end up having to relocate our equipment to uh, a different pole um, further down, you know, the street or across the street or something like that. Um, I, I, it would be mm -hmm. inappropriate for me to speak to that particular language, but I, mm -hmm. I, um, I'm not aware of anything in my profession in the years that I've been doing this in which the town would somehow have liability um, because the utility company decided to put the poles uh, underground. I would more likely anticipate that in the event that happens in the future or when that happens in the future, Verizon Wireless would work with the town, um, Eversource and Verizon Landline to just find an alternative uh, pole to, to attach to. That's yes. what I've seen in my profession. Mm -hmm. So in my conversations with Mr. Mooring, um, that's basically what he said. If there is a, a pole that had whatever was on attached to it, it would be rolled into the major, the overall project. All the, every, everybody attached to that pole, whoever they were, would be uh, consulted about where they could relocate to if they needed to be above ground or how to put them underground. Uh, it would be one overall, it would be just part of the project. Um, if the town were um, 
doing it itself. The town wouldn't be doing it itself because we'd have to contract with Eversource and Verizon and now Verizon Wireless to discuss the material they have on the pole and how they would be relocated or put underground. But it, it, so I think he mentioned it because it is something that would now be considered, or previously we wouldn't have to consider it. But I guess the, still <coughs> the question is to whether there could be a hypothetical future cost to the town um, to relocate something that if we allowed it to be installed now uh, for the reasons that are requested, are we taking on a future unknown uh, yeah, liability fine. question? Mm -hmm. Conferring with your, that if that, I mean, if we had to relocate, we wouldn't, be, we can agree that we wouldn't look to the town for any reimbursement relating to that. Well, on, um, I guess we're breaking new ground. Um, maybe we could add some kind of brief clause to our motion so it's clear you're getting permission to do this, but only as long as right, I was that poll is there. And there's a, a way to, yep. to the yeah. approval yeah, that we yeah. wouldn't be seeking. I think that would work that out yeah. just mm -hmm. fine. Um, I think there's a way yeah. to add that caveat. And then I had one other question. Uh, you, I don't know if you've had this in other communities. Uh, what... Um, provision is made if uh, something happens to the poll, have you covered it by your prior statement as, for example, by an automobile accident that involves the poll, um, by decay of the poll itself, by act of God? It's sort of always been my assumption that the utility that installed the poll has, bears that cost other than they might yep. be able to recover from um, a third party if there was a third party. And we have involved. those, we deal with those provisions in yep. the lease agreement that we have for right. the poll. Yep. And, I'll, and I'll speak a little bit to how that works because I, I have dealt with one or two of those um, so far. So um, in, a, in any municipality, in any area, um, there are also always multiple utilities that will attach to a pole, but there's one company that is the pole setting company. They're the ones that are responsible. And here, it's, it's, it's most like Wamiko. Um, if the event that a, a pole was hit by an automobile, um, that Verizon Wireless had an antenna came on. Uh, again, the utility companies um, allow us to lease space on their poles, but ultimately their mission remains the same. You know, Wamiko's responsibility is delivering electricity. So if that happened and that pole came down, the first thing Wamiko is going to do is focus on making the area secure, and then they're focused on replacing that pole and getting power back to the area, whether it's commercial or residential power. The next thing that's going to happen are either the, the fiber company like Verizon or the, um, you know, whether it's uh, Charter or Cox or Comcast is going to come in and do the work. And, and unfortunately, but, but that's just the nature of it, we're kind of last on the list. So our, our equipment would be put to the side in, in that type of situation. Oftentimes it's, it's probably permanently damaged and we would coordinate with the utility companies to, to come back out in a couple of days and, and reset it up. Um, again, what we're, um, our equipment is relatively small in nature. Our canister antenna is approximately uh, two feet tall, 12 inches in diameter. I kind of like to describe it as like a backpack. And our, our radio that produces Verizon's signal is approximately 50 pounds and uh, about three feet tall. So uh, it's not like a large refrigerator um, on there. It's, uh, and in some cases, it's pretty... Uh, comparable to the transformers that you see on utility poles in terms of size. Other questions from the board? Um, was anyone here from the public to speak to this at all? Just want to give them people an opportunity to speak to it if they hadn't. Um, any other comment from our questions? Yes. This potentially would fit just fine after we close the hearing, but why not say it now? So we're working on some language, Mr. Brockelman's perhaps working on some language that indicates the permission aspect, but not taking on the financial um, issue that seems to be implied by Mr. Mooring's last statement in terms of accommodating devices. Um, so we can work on that. And we need to make sure, I assume, that since the first one says 
Wamiko poll. The second one should say Wamiko poll as well um, in the motion itself. For some reason, the second one doesn't include that. And somehow just that our minutes make perfectly, perfectly clear that, of course, this being on Prey Street, it's not part of the undergrounding process right now, that we are not putting something up in order to take it down. Right. <laughs> it's that we, it's well within, as the maps clearly show, that we were talking entirely in this last phrase in Mr. In Mr. Mooring's memo about a future project that could involve undergrounding over there. It is not anything that's on our horizon, event horizon right now. And I don't want to preempt Mr. Bachman rewriting this, but I, um, I don't know if this takes care of all eventualities, but after the, the motion is written, I wrote, comma, until such time as that poll is eliminated or relocated, because we're giving the permission for that poll for the duration of the time that it is there, but there's nothing that is implied for any promise of anything after yeah. the poll. I would imagine if you were relocating, we'd come back for the new but, poll. Right. But I mean, I'm not an attorney, and I'm also not the time manager, but that's, yeah, we're, that, I was. We're fine with that. <laughs> does that seem to capture what we're talking about? Yeah. Future poll, I mean, anyway, <laughs> that's what I drafted. Elegant solution, yeah. yeah. Uh, so with that, if people are ready, I would. Be right, no, you'd, oh. I would close the hearing. Oh, first. right. I'm that's sorry. what I asked. That's that what I was just about to ask if we could have a, a motion to close the the poll hearing. So moved. Is there a second? Second. I assume there's no discussion, but in case there is, now's the time. Hearing none. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 So we've closed the poll hearing at 7:23. And so now we can take a motion, if you'd be so kind. So. Um, I move to approve the petition of Celco Partnership doing business as Verizon Wireless to install wireless telecommunications equipment with electricity connection on an existing utility pole in the public right of way on Prey Street, Wamiko Pole number 350-1, until such time as that pole is eliminated or relocated. Is there a second? Second. Everybody's quickly writing eliminated or <laughs> or relocated. Is there further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? That's unanimous. And if you'd carry on with the next one. Um, I, well, I was, someone said there was something missing from right the Right before the poll, the word poll at the very end is Wamiko. Uh, After Wimico, Southeast Street, comma, uh, Wamiko, poll. 91. Uh, existing when we, okay, now I got it, okay. I'm happy to read this. Um, I move to approve the petition of Celco Partnership doing business as Verizon Wireless to install wireless telecommunications equipment with electricity connection on an existing utility pole in the public right of way on Southeast Street, Wimico pole number 91, until such time as that pole is eliminated or relocated. Is there a second? Second. Is there further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? It's unanimous. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you. <laughs> so it takes care of the poll hearing for tonight. Thank you all for coming. So next on our agenda is we'll return to our, um, where are we actually? Uh, we're on to budget. So we have uh, an agenda item of uh, budget, fiscal year 18 review, uh, fiscal year 19 preview, and uh, community capital request a draft form. So Mr. Bachman, you want to sort of get us started there? And I know Ms. Aldrich sure. is here if you want to come forward. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Ms. Aldrich, our comptroller and co-finance director is here. And what our intention is today is to give you a brief verbal update on where we are in FY18, um, a preview for FY19, with the understanding that a full presentation will be delivered to you in early January as we, when we present the budget and also as we present information to the budget co coordinating group, which is scheduled for January 4th, I believe. Yes. Um, and what we want to talk about in, uh, on your desk is a memo from me plus additional information on health insurance because health insurance is the one thing that 
is going to be um, driving many of the discussions that um, that that we're that we're having tonight. So I think to begin with, we'd like to sort of give you an over a quick overview of where we are, just sort of generally for FY18 and then FY19, which Ms. Michelle Aldrich will do. Thank you. Yeah, I ask before we yes. get started. Do we have a document associated with which, which document mm -hmm. is are we talking health. about? Not community service funding, but Ooh, the group health, health insurance, insurance update. Items, yeah. Okay, great. Sorry, That's yeah. what just ma making sure I got and, on yeah. the right page. We'll, we'll talk more about the health insurance shortly. Thank you. Mr. Bockelman stole a lot of my thunder that I was going to talk about already. <laughs> but um, it's a really brief overview on fiscal year 18. There'll be more detail when I come in to do the second quarter budget review for that. Um, we finalized our tax rate and our budget is in balance for fiscal year 18. Um, although there are some challenges we're facing, as Mr. Bockelman just alluded to the health insurance um, premiums. We had in our fiscal year 18 budget that is in balance a 10% increase to PPOs. And then um, upon performance of our health claims trust fund, we then again raised rates 10% again for PPOs and 10% for HMOs. And um, as I'm sure he, he has let the board know that we were looking at a deficit there that we were going to cover with, um, try to cover with savings, cost savings in our operating budget. The health claims trust fund is still declining. We started off with a $2.2 million fund balance and as of the end of October, we're down to a million dollars, which um, caused some alarm and we're meeting with the IAC on Wednesday to talk about yet another increase. Um, so this is going to leave us with a deficit that we're most likely not going to be able to cover with operating um, savings and we'll have more detail on that after we meet with the IAC and weigh our options and meet with the um, budget coordinating group together. So I don't really have a whole lot of details of what that is right now. So there's the health insurance. The other challenge, a couple of the other challenges we're facing for fiscal year 18, the North Fire Station boiler went down, as you all know, and we had to procure an emergency under 149, chapter 149, to get this replaced as quick as possible following the procurement rules. And I just want to note that our procurement officer, Anthony Dinalaney, was really a huge asset to have at this time. He made this happen quickly and legally, and also with the help of Rob Mora as um, filling in for the um, facilities director was a big plus on our side. But we'll be looking, this project at this point has cost us $62,000. 56 of that was for the boiler itself and um, around 5,400 for asbestos abatement, and we're still working on the third vendor to get this hooked up to our emergency management system for the whole town. So we're not through with what the total cost on there will be. Um, the other thing is, the un we'll probably be looking, first of all, I want to say we'll probably be looking for a reserve fund transfer to cover this with the finance committee. And the third thing is the unknown for us right now, snow and ice. We don't know what Mother Nature's gonna throw at us this year, so we don't know where we'll be with that at year end, so that's there. For fiscal year 19, we are, um, we're in the process, we're working on it now. Uh, we're, there's still some decisions to be made on health insurance there. Uh, in our challenges for 19, again, are the health insurance. Uh, we have to, within the two and a half for each of the entities for the town budget, we have to work in all these increases to health insurance, plus cover all our contractual um, obligations for salaries. And that's gonna be a real, and keep up with our, um, and try to keep with our financial policies of increasing our capital half a percent each year to reach 10% um, to increase our OPEP contribution every year 
and to keep increasing our stabilization fund. This is going to be a challenge for fiscal year 19. We're not sure we can we can meet those challenges this year, but that's again meeting with BCG and working all that out. Uh, we have the region assessment method, which is a challenge right now. Um, we're down to two methods, S statutory four, which is our default method, which is our agreement now, which looks for the town to increase their assessment by $800,000. And then there's S10, which pretty much puts us, puts us where we would be with the other agreed on region assessment method. Another challenge for 19 is fire staffing and then meeting all our obligations for salaries. <coughs> so I guess I'll just stop yeah. there. So, so yeah, just to add on to that, this, um, the next few weeks are our decision weeks. We've gone through all of our public, our, our budget hearings uh, this week, uh, the next two weeks really, you know, this week and the week between Christmas and New Year's is when we really work to finalize the budget and make all the decisions. It's a pretty hectic week the next couple of weeks. Um, as we work to getting a presentation ready for you uh, and the Finance Committee on January 11th. The, um, Ms. Aldrich pointed out all the sort of challenges that we're facing. We're, we're going into this hoping that we can maintain the discipline to continue on the path of our financial um, you know, goals that, that the Select Board and the Finance Committee have identified because we think that's really important. But lately, we've been, I've been worried, I'll tell you, just personally, I've been worried if we, we'll be able to continue to con devote the amount of to, that we want to <coughs> devote to capital uh, because we'll be talking about cutting things that we don't want to cut. So that, that's sort of a preview, which is what we talked about. The bigger issue, as Ms. Aldrich talked about, was health insurance. And um, so uh, we're refining a sort of presentation to help employees understand health insurance more. Um, we um, provide health insurance to all of our employees, their families, and retirees through a health claims trust fund. This is a trust fund that is um, controlled by, that is contributed, the funds from this come from employees, paychecks, and from the town in the regional school district. Um, and it's money that goes into a trust fund, and then as claims come in from Blue Cross or Harvard Health, the two providers we contract with, we write checks to these providers for the services that we bought. It's a self-insured system. Um, it's not insurance, it's a trust. So as claims come in, we pay it out. We do purchase reinsurance to protect us against very large claims. Um, our attachment point is at $250,000, so a claim has to rise to $250,000 before our reinsurance clicks in. And the calendar starts for every one of those claims again on July 1. So if you have a high need um, member of our trust using a lot of health services, it will increase. Uh, it'll, the first $250,000 comes out of our pocket and what we have experienced, and I think it, I had submitted a memo to you about two months ago or three months ago, um, we talked a lot about these large claims. Um, since that time, we've last year we made design, some plan design changes, modest plan design changes. This year we had an increase on the PPOs on July 1, which was the intent of that was to have the um, PPO program carry more of its weight because the HMO program was subsidizing the PPO program. As we continued to monitor the situation, the trust fund continued to degrade. So we had to do another um, increase on October 1, and this was a 10% to both plans. Um, again, monitoring, and so that, that happened October 1. As we continue to see our experience um, come in uh, very aggressively, uh, we felt the need to increase our contribution again um, in our, our suggestion to the IAC, which is meeting on Wednesday, so I don't want to prejudice any of this because they may not agree and we may have a conversation or they may come up with a different idea, is to increase um, the rates a third time this year, which would be very onerous on employees and on the town and the school district. Um, but we don't really see a, a major um, uh, other opportunities because we can't, the trust is a standalone entity. We can't let it um, go under. There's no, um, you know, it, it's a, it's its own entity. Um, 
so we have taken a, a fair number of steps. In addition, during the time we, we went out to bid for a fully insured program, we sought um, to see if, if the Hampshire County Trust and Maya, which insures I think 63 communities in the Commonwealth were interested in, in us. Uh, at this point, Maya said they were not interested in our, in our program, although they've provided excellent support in terms of coming in and talking to us about how they assessed our situation. Um, and uh, we talked about uh, consolidating all of our uh, members into either Harvard Health or Blue Cross. Right now, about half are in each. So it's not like a lot of times the communities will have most of their employees will be in Blue Cross. So moving them into one, there'll be some modest cost savings uh, to do that. Um, so at this point, um, we feel uh, we would, we're hoping that we will just do one more um, uh, increase that would go into effect on February 1. We will, we're going to reach out to the Insurance Advisory Committee and seek their support in working with us to explore other options, because I think it's one of these things where all things are, have to be on the table. Um, and this includes, um, you know, looking at plan design changes, looking at um, setting the, the price for the products appropriately, um, and looking at whether we should be insured or have an insurance product or self-insured, um, and whether we should have two plans, meaning Harvard Health and, um, or two companies, Harvard Health and Blue Cross, or just con consolidate into one. These are all major um, decisions that impact employees and it has to be the town has developed a really strong working relationship with our employees through the insurance advisory committee the, the insurance advisory advisory committee has many very experienced people on it who've been through this before so we want to utilize that um, and leverage that experience to work together to come up with with proper solutions on this um, status quo is not an option because that's uh, we have to look at both sides of the equation. We have to look at what we charge and the services we provide. In short, where we are now is we're providing the richest program in the Valley the, in terms of benefits at one of the lowest costs. And that mismatch is not sustainable as we are seeing in the results you see on your, you see the, um, the chart that shows the balance just dropping. One of the things that we learned um, in the, as we were exploring this is that um, we're not alone. When you look at every other trust in the Commonwealth, um, they all went through this last year. The only difference with us is that our trust was stronger and we lasted an extra year. So this exact same kind of experience um, was hitting uh, every, all the other trusts. There are five or six other trusts in the Commonwealth um, last year and they all had, all had to take sort of they're doing pretty much it's, it's not a, it's not a magic box it, it, there's there's very few things that you can do that you can change plan design you increase rates you talk about contribution levels um and those are the things that are on the table so we're working really hard on this there's a, there's a we have a great team um in town hall which includes our finance people our, our hr people and our tr the people who run the trust um knocking our heads together trying to make this happen meeting with the employee groups uh, the employee groups agreed to meet we met two weeks ago I think um, and put this on the table they said we need to think about this we need to talk to our membership which was reasonable they agreed to meet right before Christmas this week uh, we have another meeting scheduled in January I think we have one scheduled in Jan January to continue this conversation um, so that's where we are the message is it's we are um, in a difficult situation, we hope we have taken the steps to um, address it. Um, the impact, uh, and we'll be able to quantify exactly the impact on the um, school district and on our budget um, relatively quickly. Right now, we have the data in from October 31, so it's not very far into the fiscal year. We're um, still enter we're still getting bills in and things like that from the November, so we have to enter that. <laughs> October was an important time because that's October is usually the date when we know who's actually enrolled because t a lot of teachers come online in September and they're, and they're pr they don't really get plugged in until October one. So the information where we have right now is we feel is pretty solid in, in terms of membership. Um, we're seeing the same. We're not seeing any um, relief on our claims experience. Um, that's why we've had to take the uh, unusual step of seeking additional funds. Did I miss anything else? No.
So, so yeah. I have a couple of questions. Sure. You know, obviously there's the, the immediate concern for fiscal 18 because the budget's essentially kind of locked in yes. at this point. But I'm thinking about as you're preparing <coughs> for fiscal 19, obviously a lot of moving pieces about what uh, plan design might look like, what mm -hmm. rates might look like. Are you sort of holding that as an open spot in your in your budget planning? What what's your plan for that? Because you won't have decisions, but yes. you're going to have to present us a budget in like the 11th. And so, how are you kind of holding that Whoa. in the short term until? Because it'll have you know it'll yes. be a hundred thousand or two hundred thousand dollars swing in you know values there. I think uh, pretty easily. So I was just curious as sort of what, what your strategy is at the moment for that. Well, that's a very good question. So something Ms. Aldrich has been in my office as of about an hour ago saying this is a critical decision and we have a meeting tomorrow of our finance staff to try and sort of figure out, not to, to decide on what's our best estimate on what we're going to do because that will drive the rest of the budget and those core decisions have to be made this week. Yes. I just wanted to comment that these are the kind of decisions that keep town managers and finance directors up at night. So really. And employees too. Yeah. And employees, but just that this isn't easy, and I'm sure you, you feel the weight of this, not just when you're here during the daytime. I just, I just wanted to say um, that this a third rate change comes into play. It will generate, we only have five months to um, to to increase the budget. We'll get a million dollars based on the November enrollment. There'll be a million dollars going into the trust for these five months. But starting for July 1st, fiscal year 19, our revenues will be for the full year around 18.3 million, depending on, on the enrollment changes. So I don't wanna be stuck to that number, but um, so we're in a better we're at a level field, at least. At least we're generating enough revenue to pay the expenses. So we're starting off with the rates at the right place, perhaps a small increase, but we're starting off at a much better place. So that will fix the trust, but then we, you know, that impacts the employee's right. pocketbook and, employ and it impacts our budget and what we can buy next year I mean, in terms of um, services and things like that. So mm -hmm. that's where the, it's not a, that's not magic money that comes from anywhere. Mm -hmm. It comes out of our budgets. We'll be looking, that's why we're looking at everybody's budget individually to say, what, where can we get savings to meet this new need for the trust? I have one other question. Just, um, you had mentioned, so I'll, I'll, I'll just mention it again. Um, we created a, a, a aspiration or a goal for our, our capital funds, but clearly that may need to be reconsidered in the context of this information and what what would be when would it be appropriate for this board to be part of that conversation it doesn't necessarily mean tonight yeah i mean um that's that's, that's on the table as we have the <coughs> meeting scheduled tomorrow and the next day to talk mm -hmm. about budget issues um half our days the next two days are going to be spent on that type of question mm -hmm. um and then we'll you know probably uh, we'll probably be in um, early January. I mean, the first clearly the first meeting is the next time that you meet January 8th, mm -hmm. and we also have the BCG on January 4th. So we'll have Both of proposals at that moment in time. And that's when, so we'll see it's gonna be soon. options yeah. and you'll make your recommendation. Yeah. I guess the other point that I would make, and I appreciate all the you're going through and that you've, and in, in the information that you've presented to us, and it is um, difficult um, to adjust to and accommodate to, but I think that it is important that we have a conversation, I'm sure that Ms. Aldrich is with Finance Committee uh, directly about um, getting this information to members of town meeting, current members of town meeting, at an earlier date as opposed to a later date so that people don't approach the town meeting season with unreasonable expectations about what they might be able to add to a budget and um, misconceptions about where we are financially as a community now. So the information you have in this little packet with the graph um, has been given to the Insurance Advisory Committee. They all have it. And they are in the Insurance Advisory Committee, just for 
you know this, but others in the audience might not, that it's comprised of members from every bargaining unit in the school and in the town, plus retirees, plus management. So it's a 20 people who sit around a table, and they all have this. They can share it with their membership if they, if they so, so choose. Um, but also what's become clear to me is that it's complicated. And we have to make it simpler for people to understand and make it as clear as possible because there's a lot of people, This, you know, we spend hours every day talking about this. A lot of people, this is important to them, but they, they have jobs to do. And so trying to come up with some kind of presentation, public meetings with the employees to help educate why this is happening. Because it, if you're just an employee, you're saying, why is this happening? It doesn't make any sense to me. Why, did, why are we in this hole? And so trying to explain that and, exp and, and help them understand that we're all in this together, that this is a trust, this is the way, it's not some big bad person out there doing something to us, um, it's that we've bought more health insurance than we were putting money into the bank for, so we have to make up that deficit. That's where we are. Uh, well, I think we also have to uh, recognize, and the graph does this, um, that Really, this over the years was a very successful program, and for a number of years, we were able to do a lot of things as a community because we really did have um, rel relatively low insurance costs, and insurance costs were not rising year for year to the extent that some other plans were ha um, were experiencing, um, and um, now the situation has changed and um, but I, 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 um, I think we all need to recognize that um, this is a form of providing health coverage that for many years served the community mm -hmm. very well um, but get back to the point that um, and I don't think that this should precede the employees I think the um, uh, working with the employees is first and foremost our responsibility because they need to understand quickly what is happening but I don't think we should de um, encourage delay on informing the legislative body of government mm -hmm. uh, as to what the realities are for the budget uh, going forward Any further comment on that? So, yes. Nice. Any further comment? I'll look at my desk. Now. <laughs> right. I don't have to look there's for a, her. There's hand. a design here. Yes, yes. I got plan. that. That Ms. was Burr, very well Ms. played. Ms. Cooper, I was trying to wait, but would you mind? Just Do you want me to turn it off? It's actually giving me a headache. <laughs> I'm trying to. It is. So this is the one that gave me a headache. <laughs> well, <laughs> yeah. So if I could just make my sentence first, and then no, no, I'm sorry, but I was waiting that. as long as I um, could. So two things I wanted, I wanted to mention, and in addition to all the really important things other people have said. So things we inherit from our predecessors, it's not okay to write choices of health care plans into collective bargaining agreements. I think we should agree that that's not okay thing to do in the, into the future. It says here that the school collective bargaining agreements stipulate both Blue Cross and Harvard Pilgrim. I mean, obviously anything's okay if the people at the table agree to it, but in terms of it being a sensible thing to do in the long run, I really hope that it's something that we'll avoid doing in future and that we'll mention to the school folks as they're working on that because it's not something that is a standard benefit in the United States, maybe in some parts of Western Massachusetts or some parts of Massachusetts. But um, one of the reasons this plan worked really well for people for a long time is it was really inexpensive. And it was far more inexpensive than the plans that many of our residents have. And at the same time, employees were not lowly paid. And so it has worked very well as long as it has, and it's unfortunate that the climate is such that it is and things cost what they do and like you said it's not that anybody did anything wrong it's just we can't do it that way anymore exactly that way we can do some variation of it anymore so I hope in light of that we'll consider not writing actual health care plan names into collective bargaining agreements in the future and the other is that I hope we will still consider I know people are always loath to look at a, a multi-tiered system but I certainly you know, I, I appreciate that the IC has been willing to talk about moving everybody to one plan because I know that's a hard decision. It is 
also not unreasonable that they would consider not letting any new employees choose between two plans. That is a totally traditional thing that happens to many employees, and it certainly happens to state employees working for the G that have or that have GIC coverage. I find the GIC benchmark a little misleading in this. Not that anybody wrote anything wrong, but that's perhaps an average of GIC plans. Not all GIC plans have the same deductible, et cetera. And speaking as someone who is a member of one of the crummier ones, um, they have quite high um, out-of-pocket costs. And so, and if you're hired after a certain date, your the amount you pay is different. And so it's not great having a two-tiered system at all, but in terms of make, when a really hard thing like this happens, I appreciate that people are looking at all the possibilities and that that could be one of them is that, in fact, it may be one thing to do now or maybe we can't switch to one right now or maybe we can, but if we can't, that's certainly new employees because they don't, they don't have it yet. So, and it wouldn't be a horrible plan. It just wouldn't be the halcyon days of what plans were. So um, I appreciate that all those things are being considered by all these people working together because we know that some other communities have not worked effectively with insurance advisory commissions and in fact had their town meetings accept a provision of mass general law that allows management to make a lot of decisions without employee input and we've not pursued that path here because we've had such a good working relationship and so i'm really proud that people are continuing to to take that effort and to to, to grind through all this right when it's not their everyday thing that keeps them necessarily up at night but now it keeps a lot more people up at night because so many of them are working on it so thank you So I think um, if you wanted to, there were a couple other topics related to budget. For example, you gave us the community capital request yes. form. Yes. I didn't know if you want to mention that or what <coughs> the other member, <coughs> if you wanted to touch on that middle. Uh, in, your, in your packet, uh, the third item under um, budget is our um, capital project request from residents. One of the things that came out of last, I think, generated by our discussion with when you're setting goals, uh, I'm not sure where, but it was like people expressed a, say, a need to say, um, how do I as a regular citizen um, get something in, on, in front of the Joint Capital Planning Committee? And our answer was, well, you go through the normal committees, that extensive network of committees we have, they, every, all committees and department has can suggest things to JCPC. Um, but it became apparent that there's, well, what about the things that don't get captured in that way? Is there a way for citizens who are interested in advancing a particular project to put something forward? So um, at your request, um, we developed a procedure and a form, that, which is a truncated form from our um, uh, JCPC committee. It doesn't have this level of detail that, the, that we'd normally request for a capital plan because it, it's, it didn't seem to be reasonable to ask this of, um, just regular people to say what's the ongoing operating cost. Well, we do ask for that, but <laughs> um, but there are a lot, a lot of other sort of detailed things about how would you, what would be your sources of, re of money to pay for this and stuff. That we feel like that's the town's responsibility. But we did want to try to get as, elicit as much information as possible. Um, if someone did have a particular capital project that they wanted to advance, um, so this memo sort of. Uh, <coughs> outlines the <coughs> process and it has a sample form that we could use and put that up on the website if you think that it's a good thing to do we can do that this week go ahead it sounded like you wanted to say something no i think you're going the same way i am um i looked at <laughs> I this and um i think it's a good start but it doesn't quite make sense to me to try to i don't think it's quite adapted yet for a citizen request, for example, and maybe I'm not understanding, so department or should that be organization? What's the person's affiliation? Is, are they mm -hmm. speaking their own great idea they had or are they representing a, a, a group or a need? Um, division, I'm not sure what division. So I think some of this just got kind of imported. Mm -hmm. um, and I, for project cost, um, I might put estimated project cost and I'm not sure some of the cost estimate, I mean, how did you arrive at this? Or what if you, I, I just think we're asking some detail that ultimately staff would need to figure out. I think the key is more under project description and justification. And here it says, give a brief one or two paragraphs 
which may be too short. I think this is mostly about narrative. And then it says, be brief, but attach additional <coughs> sheets as necessary. So you could have your two paragraphs. <laughs> you could have, I've seen people do this with, you know, in your appendix. So I think I'm more thinking about this, in, this, this works for departments for the JCPC, but you know, training, deployment, or would they really know that? What is, or at least just unpack this a little, thinking of somebody who's been working with their group out in the community for a year. Does this, is this really gonna work? So, so I, you know, we talked about that, and, but we, and the problem we, ch the challenge we had was if someone comes in and has a, a paragraph written saying, I'd like a performance space on the common or something like that, and they have a drawing of it, um, that, what do we do with that? You know, if it's not, if someone hasn't gone the, done some work to say, well, what would it cost? How did you arrive, how did you come up? We think that if someone's going to advance a project, um, it's, it, I could easily see some people coming in with a dozen things that they think should be done, and then we're devoting a lot of staff time to identifying costs and right. things so, like that. And I think that is, it does, if someone really wants to advance a project, they have to put the time in to research it and move forward on it. I, I agree that this isn't just wish list stuff, yeah. but I think um, maybe reframing this a little bit for somebody who is more of a lay person with doing this, and not every idea is gonna then get worked through, but um, I don't know, maybe, maybe other people yeah. reacted differently. So without having the one that the town currently uses, which has gone through several iterations since I last saw it um, here to compare it to, I don't know how much of it was modified to turn it into this. It looks like not a lot, and I think that's fine. I, on the other hand, think that people should do the best. That, there should somehow be a, a cover do the that says, can. do the best you can yes. with yeah. what you got, yeah. and we're, we're trying this new thing, and now we're going to see how it works because you can't have something that's completely different than what the departments have because then we're not they're not part of the process they're part of some other subsidiary parallel process and so you're trying to fit them in and and, and many of these points are points you do want to be able to track with those with all the normal projects mm -hmm. and if they have trouble figuring it out that's okay like that th that means more text less spaces hopefully they don't leave it all blank here and just do that but I think it's fine to start with this and then after you get through the first set the first time it happens <laughs> it, much like Mr. Zemeck was talking about earlier tonight then because otherwise you're going to be comparing apples and I don't know Great not fruit. even oranges insects or something <laughs> I mean it's not it's not even the same family if you change the form too much so although I can see a future form that might say not applicable, like, you know, for a certain type of resident you know, to, to be able to, they, so that they wouldn't have to fill those spaces out. But if we just start with a cover that says we're doing, we're trying to use the same form so that we can keep track of things, but feel free to offer your suggestions as to how we can make it fit your project better. Because I think it is really important that the, the thing you mentioned, I'm not sure how you say it in other than at a meeting or when you're talking with a resident on the phone, is that our intention here was not that you draw something on a napkin and bring it in and say, staple it to the thing and say, here, I want this to go on the 10 year plan. I mean, and you can't expect that staff is going to say, oh great, I mean, they might think it's really interesting, but they, they, aren't, they don't have the time to do that until some other discussion takes place. So um, I think as much of it as looks like the normal <coughs> process, <coughs> but just encouraging people to not be dissuaded by the form. Don't, right. you know, don't be mm -hmm. upset that like you've never filled anything like this out before. So a couple suggestions I'll offer in the moment mm -hmm. since we're talking about this and I'll catch my colleagues as well. I think yeah, like, the, like you said, department is probably, Division. but to have that like number four, which has department priority classification, indicating those is an important piece. To, to sort of convey the purpose of it. One of the things I think about is, is, is about how do we set appropriate expectations of how this will be evaluated by JCPC? Because it may be something that they, you know, it's, someone's done a ton of homework, they've really developed it perfectly well, it, it's ready to go, it's really a nice, clean, concise project. And others that aren't as much, or they need more time, or whatever. And so I think that'll be one thing as far as bringing this to JCPC. 
uh, will be sort of how do they, they're, they're going to have to think about how they're going to go through these and evaluate them and which to include, which rise to the level of being included on a capital plan and which don't or which aren't ready and how do you feed that back to the to the petitioner of it. And then likewise, I think, you know, uh, the other suggestion I would have is that, that these as a whole uh, perhaps are a, a, an appendix to the, the JCPC report. Just so the public at large says, here's what came in and, you know, sort of what, and obviously things that sort of made the list will be in the actual capital plan as opposed to, so then there's no, uh, it's clear that nothing got lost. Mm -hmm. It may not have gotten included, but it didn't get lost. Mm -hmm. And so some of that kind of mechanic stuff is, is the things I've been thinking <coughs> about. So I'm going to go with <coughs> Mr. Wall. I think I had a, a comment or question and then come back to Mr. Steinberg. So Mr. Wall. Yeah, I think my reaction was similar to the other ones. You know, it's a complicated form that the average person can't fill out. Mm -hmm. And I guess I was sort of assuming that the intent was to split the difference between being discouraging and saying, no, napkin scribbles, do your homework. <laughs> But I guess the other question I had is, you know, since some of these things are obviously inappropriate, in most cases people have no idea what the costs are, how many years things last, or what the impacts are, and so forth, is it also intended in a sense to help staff do a quick checklist and say, here's how I, this would map onto my expectations? I mean, is there some expectation that staff, having received one of these semi-complete forms, would at least, in, for purpose of discussion, try to sort of fill in the blanks? and make judgments about its feasibility on that basis? Mm -hmm. well, it's, it's hard Again, to... Again, with consistency of forms yeah, between... Yeah. Um, in fact, you'd like staff to sort of clean it up and sort of help guide it, but if we get 40 of these... That's the other that's question. A hard thing. If we get two, yeah. and, you know, uh, it's, it's just... A, it's, I, we don't know what to anticipate. Um, Again, I think I think we don't want to have a really low bar on this. I mean, mm -hmm. because if people people talk all they talk to mm -hmm. me, and I'm sure they mm -hmm. talk to you about mm -hmm. great ideas, mm -hmm. very creative people in this town. Um, but if if you said, okay, now you have to go to the next mm -hmm. level, you need to get someone to give you a price estimate mm -hmm. for what it's going to cost. I mean, if that's what you're talking about, just is it closer to a thousand, ten thousand, a hundred thousand, something like that? Just a, and maybe I think your your all response was that it's complicated to the normal person reading it, and, and that's. We need to dumb it down. No, I won't say dumb it down. Simplify it. Um, so, so a person who's not in the finance field like we are can understand what we're asking for. Right. I, I think some of it's just definitional. It's like they're not used to certain kinds of definitions. Yeah. yeah. So it's about sort of, you know, maybe that's the back of the form of some of the definitions of some of those things. Even if you leave them as is on the front, you know, mm -hmm. to talk about what, um, you, know, uh, you know, what's included in maintenance. Mm -hmm. you know, yeah. or mm -hmm. energy do use, or, do you know. Number eight, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Sort of what's the broad sort of, you know, de description of the categories mm -hmm. that you're asking for. And, and I mean, some people will know. I mean, obviously, people that work in, you know, if they're talking about a, a construction sort of project, and if they work in the field of construction, then they kind of have a sense of some of these things. And, um, but anyway, mm -hmm. that might help. I think it was Mr. Steinberg was next. Yeah. If you had something. In the yes. Um, now, I uh, first want to go to the first side of this, where the memorandum is, mm -hmm. and point out the second to the last paragraph. And uh, if that's what's really meant, that not all sections would be required to be filled out, then it probably has to be explicit in the form. But on the other hand, I think that we, do we really um, want an attempt made at every section so that the um, person is applying thinks about that? And is that really, uh, Mr. Ackerman, what, what you think is right? But I think, you know, it gets back to the instructions that get incorporated in the form to ultimately answer that question and make it clear. And I don't think that it uh, needs to happen on instantly at tonight's mm -hmm. meeting. Um, but I just wanted to point that out, that that is the dilemma we've identified. Mm -hmm. And I think that that paragraph suggests something that um, the rest of the discussion has not exactly been consistent with. Um, and one other thing that uh, Ms. Kruger went through the form and I don't know if this comes from um, the, the staff form, but under number four, the word check all doesn't, um, I think it's check all that apply would probably be. <laughs> I, wrote in, yeah, I wrote in applicable. <laughs> check all. 
That'd be easy one to fix. When <laughs> That's the easy one to fill out, right? Check them all. Okay. Just pre-check. Test of their reading. Yeah, yeah, I, I think you had. So, so building off of that, and so I do, I do want to make clear that I would not, if I didn't already, I would not expect staff to clean this up at all. I didn't mean I, to clean up. I mean, right. It is or fill it in. Because, I mean, at JCPC, yes, but not at some prior. No, no, I meant okay. JCPC. Right? Okay, good. Discuss it, yeah. Because I absolutely think that people making these proposals should be able to estimate useful life, and they absolutely ought to be able to go out and get some kind of cost estimate. Um, because this isn't like we're saying, let's have all the fifth graders write to us about their best ideas of something to do with capital. I mean, and our fifth graders can be surprisingly sophisticated in some cases, <laughs> but it's like, if you want a capital plan, you, you got to do some work. And so, and then if you don't know what to write and you end up putting it in the text and you say, I, I don't know how to estimate useful life of X, Y, Z item, then JCPC will figure that out. But um, I, I think we should give people the benefit of the doubt that if they're going to actually pursue, rather than just chatting about something, that they actually want to pursue something, then I do think they are good questions for them to try and figure out how to answer, even if they don't come up with a solution. So you'd like, I'll take another crack at it. Um, bring it back next meeting. It will be in just, January. Does that put it too late to be used? Send it out. Um, or do you want to have someone? I mean, I think this is this is an interesting sort of dilemma because, quite frankly, JCPC advisory to you. So this, mm -hmm. in some ways, fully is under your control. Mm -hmm. And so we're providing advice to you. And also, we wanted <coughs> to get this out so that people could actually potentially, right. near the beginning of the year or late this year, start doing their homework on estimating these costs and useful life and all that sort of stuff. So I'd say, you know, I think we're of an opinion that I think that um, you might be able to just sort of circulate to us, uh, you know, the sort of cover and instructions that go with it. And, and you can and respond back to me And we'll respond to yeah. you individually to okay. you. And yeah. so the it. idea being that we can, you know. Because it's not deliberative, you're just advising right. the manager right. independently. And, yeah. yeah, and, you know, given that you have nothing to do between now and the 11th or so of January, on budget or anything easy you get plenty of time to work on this right well but <laughs> but nonetheless the, the idea being that we can get it out yeah. for folks to utilize after you yeah. comment from us so just um to be clear i wasn't saying not to have a version of this i just yeah. think right. it, i think it you know and if, i think you've got the notes but i'm happy to you know share my scratchings which doesn't mean they're the ultimate but yeah as miss brewer said i think most of this is going in the right direction so, it's like another so what we attempted to do was to help JCPC analyze this right. the, the things right. instead of right. saying we could you know we would talk about creating a separate form that was very friendly right. but then JCPC right. would get this whole separate category that didn't have yes. the level of detail yeah. so we aired on this one instead of yeah. that one. yeah yeah so thank you mm -hmm. um did you want to talk about this memo sure at all? you can do okay. that too so since it's sort oh, of under a funding category things um, oh, so we're still doing budget things there's a memo in our packet related to community services funding oh, and that status desk. Mm -hmm. um, so it was I'm just on the two minute break hmm? facilities break why don't we take a brief recess okay so Maybe we'll take that, a little uh, recess and and let everybody take a, a couple minutes to and I read it okay walk around the block you don't have to yeah. hang around thank you Sonia appreciate it so I believe we're all back if you would like to join us we're gonna we're gonna jump to a separate section of our our agenda I didn't realize someone was here to uh, to uh, speak to a particular item but under licenses uh, we have a uh, a uh, common victual license that we're going to do tonight uh, we'll we'll uh, I'll suggest that we pull it out of our uh, consent calendar for the purposes of, of having a little discussion about it um, but if you'd like to introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about why you're here and Tell us about your business. And sure. Tell uh, my name about is, your business. And my name is Tom Schmidt. Uh, thank you very much for having me. I, I won't take up too much of your time um, with, with certainly a less than important business matter than you are talking about. But I am the new owner of Bart's Ice Cream Company up in Greenfield, Mass. And uh, I, along with myself, or excuse me, I, myself, and uh, Eliana Gibble is the owner of the Bart's Ice Cream store that we um, are opening down, the, down on uh, Pleasant Street. So I just want to take the opportunity as you review the license, and I know it's uh, the, the procedure, but 
just to say thank you to the town. Um, we've had a process where we've been working with the health department and, and Eliana has been working much more closely. Um, they've been, everyone has been great to work with. Um, everyone that's walked through our door has been incredibly receptive um, to us and, um, and been incredibly patient as we sort of managed this process and, and got into the space and, and sort of did what we needed to do. So really my, my goal here was to, you know, I felt that it was important enough that, you know, you were considering us and the license that I just wanted to say thanks. Um, we're thrilled, we're absolutely thrilled to be here. Um, we understand the history um, that has gone, you know, the last 30 years that Barts was here um, and really take that very seriously and are excited to present uh, a store and continue to present the product that I think everyone here has been very used to. Um, recipe's not changing, so uh, everyone can be very uh, comfortable knowing that. So that's it, just wanted to say thank you. Um, and uh, we look forward to um, you know, serving the public going forward. Uh, as I said, I didn't want to bring ice cream today to, uh, to, to, to sway the vote, but I will uh, be sure to bring some uh, to next time. So thank you. Well, thank you for coming in tonight. We do like it. I'd like to give people an opportunity if they want to, to come and tell us a little bit about their businesses in town and, and give them an opportunity to sort of share the fact that they're, they're here and, and uh, do a small bit of advertising as it were. Sure. Um, so thank you for coming in tonight. Any of the members want to offer comment? Mr. Steinberg? I was going to make a motion actually. Please do. I, I, I move to approve Common Vitriller's license for BICA LLC doing business as Bart's Ice Cream, Amherst 103 North Pleasant Street, number one, with hours of operation from November to March, Monday through Thursday, 2 p.m. to 8 p.m. Friday and Saturday, 12 p.m. to 10 p.m., and Sunday, 12 p.m. to 8 p.m., and from April to October, Monday through Sunday, 12 p.m. to 10 p.m., Eliana Gibble, manager. Is there a second? There is a second. Discussion. I was yes. just going to make two quick comments. One is thank you for reading those hours so clearly, Mr. Steinberg, because I know that's been one of the things that people have commented to me, that they're a little confused about what's happening at that location over the last several months. And so to be able to tell them that it's just that during this season, you don't open until 2, but come back later in the afternoon. Just don't go at lunchtime. And if we also have the gentleman's name written for our minutes, because he doesn't actually appear on the uh, common bit to make sure we have it spelled correctly. Sure, my name's uh, Thomas Schmidt, it's S-C-H-M-I-D-T. Mm -hmm. Great, that's what I guessed. Sure, Thank uh, you. and we will be, just for purposes of, we will be closed until mid-January while we get all of our things together um, on the business side of it, so, and then we'll be reopening to the hours that were mentioned. Um, Screw it. That's gonna be my question, it's not really related necessarily. You said the recipe wasn't changing, but are you making any changes this is a chance to tell us and the public about what your vision is. Is it going to be exactly as it is right now, or what do you? Oh, I could spend a lot of time talking about my vision for this, <laughs> well, but uh, I appreciate the question very much. And um, the vision for the store, um, as I, I believe what you're asking about, is you know we we would we want to continue serving what we believe is the highest quality product in, in that category, um, but we also want to. Um, expand the menu but we want to be it, it's going to be different we believe than what was there before um, which was bagels and coffees and things like that and what we're focused on more is smoothies and juices and things that highlight the, the, the our partners that help us produce our products so for example the um, something that goes into the local peach ice cream that can go into a smoothie that can go into a juice you know it all can and it can highlight the farmer that we are working with and that's our Entire goal is to support lo the local farmers, the local partners, uh, everyone, a high percentage, over 80% of what we put in our ice cream at Bart's is local. And so the store is really our, our window to show the community um, in Amherst and everybody else the, what Bart's ice cream is about. And then by doing that, we can bring in other products from people and use that as a platform to, to offer other products from local farms that may not have that opportunity. Um, this store, we don't plan on having a large brick and mortar strategy, so to speak. Um, this was an opportunity for us to take, uh, I think, return to a location that was we revered and I think people did. It will be our flagship location. Um, it's the only location that offers all 38 flavors of Bart's ice cream, which is a lot of fun. Um, we will be using it to try samples. Um, so a new flavor we tried this year was strawberry ba lime basil, which nobody else had in, in anywhere else. So. It's a real, it's an opportunity for us to, um, to do that. And I also tell you that the people in Greenfield um, who don't 
no one really knows much about are, are wonderful people and are absolutely thrilled about this. And they're thrilled as much as I am that they have an opportunity to come and see people eating their ice cream and see that interaction. Um, so it's really been a nice, um, I guess, event for us as a company to see this sort of evolve. And so, you know, we're thrilled about it. We're thrilled to um, you know, be back next summer. And unfortunately, it's been a little slow in, in, the, in the winter months, but you know, we, it gives us a nice opportunity to get ourselves together. And we really look forward to presenting something that you, you, you folks will be proud of. I mean, I think it's, this is not, we're not staying in Western Mass. You know, our goal is, as a BART's company is moving to Eastern Mass and everywhere else. So um, we have 1,300 locations throughout New, New England that are selling our, our ice cream. You know, we're in Whole Foods, we're in Roach Brothers in Eastern Mass. So it's, it's a brand that's gonna be more prevalent um, in the area and I think would also, also just bring much more, um, I think for you, much more uh, focus on Amherst where the location is and, and where, you know, um, really where our birthplace is, you know, here in Northampton. So that's kind of our, in summary, is where we're at. Great, thank you. All right. Well, thank you very much. Appreciate it. it. Is there further good. discussion from the board? Oh, sorry. Oh, no. Hearing none. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Thank you so much. It's unanimous. Thank you, Tom. It's diplomatic if you left before we voted. <laughs> right. We appreciate your patience for waiting for us. Yeah, we did. So next up, did you want to? Go into that memo, or do you want to wait and do that? Whichever, whichever you prefer. Um, since we're talking about finances, why don't you go ahead and give us a little update on that uh, that memo relative to community services funding? Yeah, I'm not sure what I did. Um, so, in in your, pa in your packet or on your on your desk was, was a memo about community services funding. So, as you recall, the town meeting voted an additional sixty thousand dollars for community services. Um, that was done after our, our budget priority setting had been done, and so we have been looking at how to allocate those funds that have been put into the budget. Um, two things had me hesitate in terms of making a decision. One was um, having a thorough, well, several things. One was having a thorough discussion about what the highest need was um, in terms of our talking to people about what was the highest need in, in Amherst. And several, there were a lot of, there are a lot of needs. Um, three came to the um, surface and as the highest need. One was um, a program to conduct better outreach to the Latino community. Um, a pro the second was a program to address the challenges of those with mental health or sub substance abuse problems. And the third was a program to help prevent homelessness. Um, Going into this, it was not my intention, especially given our expectation for our budget next year, to create a new position um, to, and I, th and I don't know if that was the intent. I think the intent was to provide services to people in need, and I don't think that was necessarily at this point, um, and I don't think the town could support a program on $60,000 that would hire a person, so I was not intending to hire a person, but instead um, have a, a group that would be able to provide a service. Um, two things, external things have happened that have influenced the um, where we are at this point. One was the hurricane that um, did such devastating damage to Puerto Rico. Um, we had anticipated and still anticipate, and there's been coverage of this, additional people coming to Amherst. We did not know what the need was going to be. The, the community mobilized very actively and um, was preparing to um, receive and welcome people, but we didn't know what the needs that they were bringing would be. It turns out that that need wasn't as great as we had uh, thought could be possible, and uh, the community has been very generous in reaching out to people and providing homes and services, so that was not, that has, that seems to have been um, uh, pared away. The second need, however, is uh, quite real and might dominate um, the need for this funds, and that is that there is a um, earmarked uh, line item in the state budget of $200,000 for Craig stores. And that at this point under the governor, the governor has held all expenditures for earmarked items in the budget. Um, this same thing happened last year. Our legislative delegation was successful in releasing those funds so that Craig stores could operate at its full capacity for the entire time that it, that it had funding. Um, I'm not as confident that that will happen in, um, this year, and the governor has indicated he's not intent in, interested in doing that. So two things on that. One is um, uh, 
there are people who are organizing and it's on the you know the, the chair is aware of this and we'll bring it up tonight about whether the to initiate a letter writing campaign to the governor uh, in our legislative delegation to um, encourage them to release um, the funds that are designated for Craig stores um, failing that uh, having this $60,000 available to support homelessness activities in the, in the, in the town, um, we would have to do an RFP for that. Might be something that might be um, wise for us to pay attention to. Um, so that's, that's where we stand. Um, we're halfway through the year and we've got this money there um, and uh, it hasn't been spent. And I know there are some people who are eyeing it saying, why not this, why not that? Um, I'm really conservative about this, um, but it, we will do a, um, you know, an RFP, which is what would be required to do in January, I think, um, depending on where we are at that point in time in terms of the governor's budget. So open the questions and I miss. Ms. Brewer. Okay, I'll dive in. So um, I appreciate you keeping us updated on this and you'd given us previous indications of the direction this was going and so this is no surprise. What is confusing to me though about this and, and <coughs> on the one hand, I, it's actually good we haven't made any decisions because of the situation with Craig's store, so yay, that works out, um, is that I don't know how to describe to anyone what better outreach to the Latino community means. We used to have a Cambodian outreach worker and to be blunt, people said, oh good, we're doing something for the Cambodian community. They didn't know what it was, but they liked the idea of it. Um, what does this even mean to, to, in order to, for the, some segment of the Latino population mm -hmm. to access something? Yes, so this, this is not something I made up. It came, comes out of the human services yeah. group because that's who I would say, where is the greatest need in the community? So we go to Julie Fetterman and she convenes a group that meets monthly and that was listed as one of their highest needs. Uh, what does that mean? It means there are, uh, we have uh, a large Latino community that isn't accessing many of the services that are already uh, out there and available for a number of reasons. It might be that they're not documented and they're afraid to go to places. It might be just a transportation issue. Um, there are services in the community that they felt um, people who live in town weren't taking advantage of that they could. And so there needed to be some um, outreach to say, hey, you, if you're at the end of, uh, there were an, a lot of anecdotes shared, and we could, I mean, Julie could talk about that, where people are at the end of the month, they're at the end of their paycheck, they don't have the food, they literally don't have food. Mm -hmm. They are nervous about going to the survival center. The survival center is saying, come, we have things for you. Um, the survival center has now been going to South Point with their mobile food. Uh, things, but food security was another issue for a lot of people, and um, and so trying to break down the barriers to seeking, and it could be cultural too. It could be just it could it could be a lots of different reasons why people aren't accessing the services we already have. Um, so that was the sort of impulse for this was to um, gain access uh, to needed services to the and make it's not just putting up posters and saying, hey, there's this thing. It's about right. building credibility within a community or, or seizing on people who already have credibility built up. And if we do an RFP, obviously we'd have to be much more specific about what we're talking about because it right. would be a service for a period of time to make inroads into the community. That's very helpful. That's correct. If I could just add, and I think, um we did talk about specifically about mm -hmm. food security around the Latino community, but it but it's you know interwoven with those relationships. And we talked about something that we could fund that if it were not to be funded in a subsequent year would not do dam you know undo damage. So we're not we we approach this not assuming that this was an ad forever and ever, but. Um, First of all, we don't have the full year, and we don't know um, about next year for all kinds of reasons. So what could we take on that would be a valuable service but didn't need to be sustainable for the long haul? Yeah. 
You were there too. <laughs> I was there too, but I have nothing <laughs> okay. to add. I think, to the, I think that'll be the critical piece with your deliverables is understanding how our budget's shaping up. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, you, I would think that you would expect this to be updated pretty much weekly. I mean, every mm -hmm. meeting now until budget, some yeah. decisions are made. Okay, mm -hmm. great. Thank you. Any other questions? All right, so um, moving on to a much more mundane sort of topic, which is remote participation policy, uh, which is in our packet. Um, and so when we originally adopted that a year ago, um, or so, a little less than a year ago, uh, we put a, a, a sunset on it, primarily just so we could review how it went. And so um, I'm going to lean on Mr. Bachman to sort of perhaps lay out a little bit of that. Sure. So um, in your packet, there is the, 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 um, the policy, but just sort of a summary on how often it's been used. And we have a very robust policy with a procedure for people utilizing it. And um, one of the requirements is that they notify the um, our office if it's being used. And that has happened six times during the year. Uh, five of those were with the Charter Commission. One time was with the school committee. Um, this does not apply to the regional school committee. They have their own remote participation policy. So um, <coughs> the sort of uh, um, uh, requirements to report haven't proven to be onerous on any committee. Uh, several committees, when I reached out to all of our departments to say, is your committee used this at all? Uh, that and just didn't fill out the paperwork. Most, uh, nobody said that they used it and didn't fill out the paperwork. Uh, several said that they were happy that it existed in case they needed it, uh, but they didn't need it this year. So, you have something? Yeah, um, I was going to actually include this under member reports, but I think I'm going to pull it out and do it now because it's what we're talking about. I did go to the DAAC meeting, and we'll cover other items from that, another item from that later. But um, this topic came up because it was fairly clear that DAC was using remote participation um, and it appeared that they did not therefore follow the form and send the form in, but um, at the meeting that I was attending this past week, there was somebody there participating remotely. Second thing um, about that was that it caused then some discussion because um, it is difficult for people who are, um, have disabilities to always physically get to meetings because the amount of arrangements that have to be made for transportation purposes. And um, the, um, there was a great degree of appreciation for the ability to do that um, that was uh, expressed. There was only one member. Everybody else was there in person which then got into an additional discussion, which I th have handled on my own as the liaison, um, because there were members of the um, um, committee that um, had two things. One is, is that they felt that because of their unique um, circumstances, the consideration should be given to not even requiring that a quorum be physically present at the building, but that they, uh, where the meeting is being held, but that they should be able to participate. And secondly, they raised the question of whether changing their status, asking town meeting to change their status to a disability commission would actually um, have um, the effect of making that change. Uh, th unfortunately, the open meeting law is clear on both mm -hmm. points. Uh, when you go to the open meeting law itself, it says very explicitly that um, a um, quorum and the chair must be physically present at the meeting and that if a disability um, commission exists in the community, it can declare that it is particip um, a remote participation policy on its own, but it, that it must be consistent with the statute. Um, so that um, if they were to um, have town meeting at some future date, make them a disability commission, it would still be required that any remote participation that they use 
that there has to be um, a quorum present and the chair has to be present. They can't create that exception. I have communicated um, that by sending them um, the exact wording of those two sections of the um, uh, statute so that there's no confusion about where they stand with it. Um, so that was um, just an additional part that I would have reported later, but report now. <clears throat> and I appreciate that maybe hearing it from Mr. Steinberg meant that it was paid attention to this time because I've been telling their staff support and the members that they used to have these exact pieces of information since the day the open meeting law was revised to treat disability commissions, commissions on disability, differently. Because for years, that group that's the problem with Amherst being forward thinking, right? We came up with the Disability Advisory, Access Advisory Committee before dis commissions on disability were a thing. So they never became an official commission on disability, so they don't fall within that section. As Mr. Steinberg pointed out, they could, and it never goes anywhere. There's this conversation at least every three years about how they could pursue it, and um, there are some odd little parts of mass general law associated with parking fines or something for them, et cetera. So these weird little quirky things that could apply to them, it's not just so that they could have remote participation. It, there are other reasons to potentially have it, but I'm sure there are downsides too. And Mr. Molay's worked through some of those with them in the past. And so, um, great if they wanna move forward with it because I totally agree that it seems and completely reasonable, and I'm glad that Open Meeting Law carved out that exception for commissions on disability. They just didn't consider that we might have something that's basically the same thing that isn't the same thing. So we're not allowed to just let them treat it that way. So, um, you know, we certainly, I mean, I'm sure Mr. Malloy is helping them and staff would continue to work with them on what the pluses and minuses of doing it that way would be and then could get it on the town meeting warrant if necessary for the spring, if for no other purpose than to do this, because they never quite got off the mark for previous reasons that they had, but maybe this is enough of an incentive and there aren't enough downsides that maybe it's worth pursuing. So maybe that goes on our list of potential theoretical warrant articles for the spring so that they have more time to, to pull that information out again as right. to what their advantage might be to do that. Right. Yeah. So let, let me be clear though that um, Making themselves a commission doesn't do anything for them as far as remote participation. Yes, it, it does, actually. It, no, it does not. I read the statute again, and I... I, I, I disagree. Uh, um, so we're going to have to so agree to disagree have, on that. Um, if, uh, I think that it uh, is something we're going to have to agree to disagree on. The, the other, until you've read the statute again. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> or I've read the statute again. I'll take I'm it either way. I'm confident it's different for yeah, commissions we'll, we'll talk on about it later. We'll right. talk about it later. Yes. The other thing is to, that the, the uh, um, committee itself did recognize that they had this discussion with Mr. Musanti, and Mr. Musanti was um, uh, advising against making the change and had reasons um, that he expressed about not doing that. That's slightly different. Um, and maybe I didn't exactly understand you, uh, Mr. Stenberg, about the utilization, but it seems like there may have been some committees utilizing this but not yeah. um, coming through with the paperwork. And I just wonder, because it is new and, and um, it's only, it's, we're at the end of the first, if it's just a, a, a reminder back out to committee chairs of what it is and uh, we're happy people have been using it reminder if you're gonna use it this is here's the form you know just because it that I think it's probably time at the end of the first year to uh, do that kind of noticing um, because what what we're doing now is considering uh, not having a sunset not having to review it at the end of you know we are at the end of year we're not gonna do this every year so just a thought to, to build off of that, I think you know part of the reason it has the formality that it has is because we don't want people to over uh, to unintentionally not take into consideration things that uh, the formality does consider, and there's reasons behind yeah. why it has certain formal things and why the law has certain formal things in it. Regulated under state law. Exactly, and yep. there's intention behind those things, and so it's just a reminder of those things to some extent. Um, on a second point. 
and I may be misremembering, I think Ms. Brewer may know this, um, you know, one or more of the following factors make my physical attendance unreasonably difficult. Didn't that part of it yes. change? Mm -hmm. So this is so that this might is, be an edit we need to make in this one. So, so do you recall? Wait. Um, so could we just hold up for a sec? Yep. <laughs> so on, first of all, I'm trying not to be frustrated about <laughs> the know. issue that trying I know I'm right correct <laughs> about, um, and because that is one of the points of open meeting law is that it was changed for that purpose on commissions on disability. Right. But aside from that issue that I'm trying to let go of right now, <laughs> yes, there are several changes that were made to open meeting law, and that's why Ms. Burgess is handing out new copies of open meeting law stuff to right. people as they get appointed. It's a newer version of the book, et cetera. That's not but we're not going to have this fight because I will find it by the end of the I meeting and I will like prove that not, it's accurate. Not and <laughs> at any rate, um, that yes, you no longer have to specify which of those exceptions you belong to. You only have to say that one of those reasons is the reason. You're just saying, I have a valid reason. Right. It's one of these reasons. I don't have to tell you what that reason is, which I think is great. And it's the sort of thing that we told them when they wrote the regulation and we said, you don't need to be that specific. And they said, oh, yes, we do. And now they've changed their mind. So, hey, they learned eventually right. that it was not necessary and not useful because as we all talked about when we were developing this policy, we didn't want people to know that people were away. Right. You know, we didn't want people to know personal right. stuff. Right. Geographic distance. <laughs> and how would here's, we here's prove it? How long will it take right? you to, to, to disable <laughs> oh. their alarm while they're gone? Right. Yes, exactly. So we I, did I not think want that. In, in that so regard, I mean, I, what I'm saying is, I'm not, I'm not up for having just anybody like revise this. So well, could the, you assign me back to revising the form? Um, I mean, taking the check spot, check mark spots off of that would probably do it because the actual phrase that says I certified to the person chairing the meeting yep. that one or more of the following factors make my physical attendance unreasonably difficult. You just period. don't check which ones. <laughs> yes. And just not have them be checklist type but, things. But, we but need I don't to know what else. Show that we have a revision date. I mean, we have very, we're very we're, we're right. not going to get sloppy now after we did such a great job of saying voted this January 23rd of 2017. Then we right. can say we revised it. On Whatever it is. December 18th. So to I guess, say that. I guess the only concern is that it currently expires on December 31st and between then and when we meet next, which will be the 8th of January. So the 9th probably would be when someone, how many meetings are there going to be between now and then, uh -huh. between the 31st and the 8th that might have need of a policy that wouldn't exist? Because I, I'm perfectly fine. and <coughs> I'm, I'm a little confused. The motion is just about the sunset date. Right. And now we're talking about, I know we're at the review time, but and now we're talking about revising the form. Can we vote to eliminate the sunset and still come back and make other adjustments to the form or the questionnaire or right. the Absolutely. administrator? So unless there's a real reason not to, I was prepared to make the motion that we eliminate the, 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 sunset. the December 31st <coughs> and not have any sunset. But that depends on what if people feel they want to do that or are ready for that. But that's all that's in front of us for if, tonight. If, if I could clarify, since our chair brought up that particular provision, which I had included in an email previously, then yes, since, since you brought up the idea of sending it out again, sending it out again without making the revision right. didn't make okay. a lot of sense. Okay, so that's what that's okay. you're right. That's where we went that's sideways. That's a separate on that. yeah. sideways but, thing. But for tonight, if it's the board's yes. pleasure, I think we would be happy to remove the particular sunset date and maybe also not have a sunset date. So with that, I'm going to um, read the motion. I move to amend the remote participation policy approved January 23rd, 2017, eliminating the sunset clause, thereby removing the expiration date of December 31st, 2017. Is there a second? There is a second. Is there further discussion? I hope not. <laughs> Hearing none. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Yeah. So, um, I, yes, it's unanimous, <laughs> and I would recommend if people are comfortable with it that between Mr. Slaughter and I, we just simply uh, revise what will change the policy to show that it was revised on the such and such date to remove the sunset clause. Like, we'll put mm -hmm. that in a little footnote or something. Okay. Right. And then we will also fix the form that's also dated right. the same day and we'll just fix them we won't send them back here unless as you guys are looking at it you're reminded of something that somebody told you was up we empower to fill you out. to do that 
And that way we'll just fix the minimal to the, to the group. Because yeah, yeah, we'll most of it is mechanical fixes. Mm -hmm. Yes. It's not a, it's not a it's uh, not substantive fix. Right. Right. It doesn't change the nature of whether or not someone's going to remotely Thank you. participate. It's all within the scope, as they like to say. Within the scope. Right. I like that. All right. Thank you all. So next on our agenda is, uh, I'm sure what everybody's been waiting for, um, the uh, Charter Commission final report and proposal. We uh, have on here a select board position discussion, whether we want to take a position on uh, the uh, question that's before the, the community this coming March. We will, we're obligated to put it on the ballot, um, whether we want to uh, take a position on it as a board uh, is the topic that we're taking up at this point in time. So I, I don't really have any more introduction to it than that, other than to say, how does the board feel about taking a position as a board on the charter question, whether we should or we shouldn't? Um, you know, as voters, we'll all get our opportunity to express our opinion in the, in the voting group, but do we as a board wish to make a statement to community regarding this particular uh, item before the town so yes I would like to state that um, I do not know what the select board did last time around because I wasn't on it yet then but and I don't remember and I didn't go look it up but um, the school committee last time out came out against it I know because I pushed them to do it and so um, there was a specific school committee resolution that was written with all the lovely whereases and recommending that the town, for the reason, if they look to the school committee for an opinion, do X, Y, or Z. So there is some, what I'm saying is there is some precedent for an elected body to do this within Amherst in addition to the way it's done in all other kinds of places. Like I said, I don't recall if the select board at that time took a position or not. Um, <coughs> certainly the school committee did. and. There, I mean, there are plenty of people who ask us, obviously, and do we have an opinion as a board and do we have one as individuals, but I just wanted to remind people out in the viewing audience, if not those of us sitting here, that we have, this has been done before. However, if someone were to ask me if I thought the school committee should do it now, I would probably say that they might want to think twice about it because most of them have not been on the school committee for very long, and they have not been involved in town government very long. If they have an opinion and they want to come together as a board, certainly, then you know I'm not going to tell the school committee what to do. But in terms of the school committee I was on had longer serving members who had been in town government longer, and I think so had a slightly different perspective, and it was a different proposal as well. Right. Right. Other comments? Precedent. Thoughts about this? Well, let's, not, here. let's not always have the girls go first. <laughs> I just, I, I've thought about this a lot because we've, we've been like, when are we going to talk about it? And it's sort of been on the horizon. Um, maybe I could, you know, it, it, hearing somebody else's opinion, I could change my mind. But I don't, at this point, think it makes sense for us to take a board position. I think certainly as individuals, um, we could. I plan to. Um, I want to be able to think through my own personal position and articulate it probably in writing in the next couple of weeks in mid to late January. But I'm not sh since we are the old structure and we're trying to fulfill our um, obligation to, to support that structure, I I'm not sure what it is. Maybe if we all agreed one way or the other, it could tip the scales a little, but I think it, it could be problematic, and I think people, uh, well, I guess some people want us to take a board position and some don't, but I just don't know that it makes sense to do that, to be persuaded. So I want to hear other people. Mr. Wall? I've gone back and forth on this, too. And on the one hand, it seems that if we're the body that's the town's collective chief, chief executive and all of us like that previous school committee have a great deal of experience in town government, then our opinions ought to matter. On the other hand, uh, Ms. Kruger's reference to all the where or the Ms. Brewer's reference yeah. to all the whereases and so forth reminds me that on what basis we'll be doing that. It could be an hours long or a weeks long discussion, or it could be five minutes where we vote on the basis of our preconceived uh, decisions about this. So I th you know, as I, as I think about it, 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 it would, I'm not sure what shape the discussion would take that would be meaningful 
as opposed to individual statements. So I'm chewing it over. But it, would, it is unusual for us to take a position on a major issue without any kind of background preparation, documentation, extended discussion on a very full agenda at this point. Simon? <coughs> I guess um, I'm hesitant to take a position as a board. And um, I distinguish two things in my own personal um, history with this. When I ran for my current term on the select board, which was just this past year, um, during this year that we're in, calendar year, um, what I said um, in my campaign was that as a member of the select board, if reelected, I would be committed to um, helping implement a new form of government if that is what the voters choose or if the voters choose not to implement the new form of government to um, exercising uh, my role as a member of the select board to try and um, make the current form of government work as best it can moving forward. And I distinguish that from um, the position that I've taken publicly regarding the charter itself. And um, so I think that um, when you get to the question of the select board taking a position, I sort of fall on the first statement that I had made when I ran for office, that that's what my responsibility is as a select board member as opposed to my opinion as, a, as an individual. Um, and uh, so I would be hesitant to suggest that uh, we take a position as a board. Did you want to come? So, if I could. Recycle I mean, back we, to And we sort of could, some history as you out said, earlier, talk about this for weeks because we don't have a document per se, and I'm not suggesting we come up with one. Um, there was a different proposal in a different time period, et cetera but um, that had some particular aspects that this one doesn't. Is the, while I appreciate everything you just said, Mr. Steinberg, one thing I think that is a little, that, that speaks a little to me is that making things work the best they can is what we do every day when we are working on this job, which we do all year round. Um, and at the same time, that does give us real opinions about how to make things work better. And so if we decided, I, I, what I guess I'm trying to say is, if we decided as a board that we had an opinion, I would be fine with that, if, depending on, well, I guess depending on what it was. Um, because I think it is valid that we have, I guess what I'm trying to say is that we, I think it's valid that we have opinions about what go government looks like. Um, as opposed to we have a personal preference for a candidate. And that, that's a very different thing. And I'm not sure that I would separate this as much, perhaps, as, as it sounded in terms of, you know, and, and I don't want to misspeak of what Mr. Steinberg said, but <coughs> I don't consider our form of government a personal preference. I think we all have really strong feelings about what happens here week after week and whether or not we think it's going the way we <coughs> perceive it should be. Um, in terms of how we do things on a day-to-day -day basis and how things might be done differently under a different system. So I don't want us to shy away from having real opinions on this, but it may well be that it turns out that it, because of the other reasons we're also talking about, it makes sense that we say, you know, I'm speaking for myself, I'm an experienced this, that, and the other thing, and this is what I think but our board chose not to take a position because it just seemed like too much work, <laughs> if no other reason. <laughs> because re in reality, right, which, which phrases would we use? What would be the most important things to say um, about our opinion on the form of government that we could all agree on? We may all have very different views, even if we vote, we were all polled today to vote one way or another, we might have very different reasons mm -hmm. for those views, despite our shared experiences. So. While it's convenient for people to be able to say, oh, well, so-and-so supports and so on, and, and this group does this and this group does that, maybe it's not as relevant as long as we all, I think, 
what's more important to me is not whether or not a campaign can use us for or against as a select board, but although that would be convenient for them. And we do have very specific rules, which Lauren Goldberg talked to us about a long time ago and which we'll look at again in terms of we are allowed in some cases to be named as select board members who feel a certain way, but not as a select board in certain types of ads based on office campaign, political finance and everything and ethics and everything else that we have to combine all those issues together. So it isn't that we have to be quiet and it but we just have to make clear that who we're speaking for so that when people hear us speaking, they know who we're speaking for so that one of us isn't doing something different than everybody else in terms of describing what the select board is doing. And we've worked together well enough that I don't think we'll have any difficulty doing that. I can perceive other boards I've served on in this very room, um, which would have much more of a struggle with figuring out this is what we agreed. Even if we don't agree on a position, this is how we agreed to handle it. And this is how we agreed to talk about it mm -hmm. as individuals. The thing I think about with regard to this is, is um, or the thing that's crossed my mind is we've, you've each been speaking is sort of um, how would taking a position as a board impact our efficacy regardless of how March turns out? So whether the charter passes or doesn't pass, does that taking a position then undermine our ability uh, and our authority to execute because uh, four of you for sure will be on the continuing select board after March, whether it be in, in uh, you know, continuing the system we currently have or, a new, or preparing for a new system. So, um, and I hope to be, um, but I, I, that's the thing I think about. And I, I think that that's where it provides a complication that um, by taking position, it provides a complication uh, that doesn't exist if we don't take that position. So I, I'm a, a leaning a little more in, in that regard that it, um, how and what we do after the election, regardless of how it turns out, is, is less impacted. However, people may not be able to separate our personal opinions from our board position, but I think that at the same time, you know, sort of as an institution, it complicates things. But it's, it's difficult at times to separate sort of the board from the five members that make the board, but. Um, just on that point, I mean, that, I think that follows what I was thinking that I worry um, the downside of taking a board, one of the downsides of taking a board position is that then certain actions either before or after the election may be seen as colored by the fact that we declared as a board one or the other that our, you know, that our decision making um, become, becomes more suspect, although granted if each of us takes the same position and, and chooses to publicly announce that, it could s still have that same result, but somehow it seems be a little bit different and not all five of us might choose to make a statement. I mean, we vote, no, you know, we have uh, autonomy in the voting booth. We don't have to make that statement. In terms of undermining, I think that there are various levels of that, and one is based on people's perception, and another is based on if we come out in a concrete way. And as Ms. Kruger pointed out, it may be that not all of us have decided yet. It may be that not all of us decide to speak about it publicly. Um, all those things are, are theoretically possible still at this point. I think that it's also fair to say that I have not... I have only anic data, not real data associated with this, but there are a number of people based on our town meeting, both my perception and then also direct conversation with people associated with our most recent town meeting, that there were people who just assumed that we are all pro-change. And I said, we haven't talked about this as a group at all yet. I don't see why people should be making that assumption. So what I'm, what I'm pointing out is that people will make assumptions anyway <coughs> about what we're doing. And then if people choose to speak individually or not, you know, we, we're already suffering some of that assumption associated with our efficacy in terms of, uh, as we talked about when we talked about how town meeting went and so it's it's not like this is something that's just starting from a neutral position people are 
making assumptions already about what we're doing. But I do think that many valid points have been made about not trying to come together as a board per se to come up with a specific set of reasons to do one thing or another and just depend on each of us to make it clear that we're speaking for ourselves if that's the way this seems to be going. <coughs> so boring. <coughs> No, no one's suggesting a, a motion right at the moment. So, um, I, you know, we can, I, I think the, the, you know, certainly welcome to bring this back onto the agenda of people's, you know. Something changes. You know, <laughs> want to share with me uh, something and, 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 you know, ask to put it on the agenda. I'm certainly willing to take that. Um, no one, it, as far as I know, no one's ready to make a motion regarding this. So at this point, we'll, um, We'll move on, but certainly I'm I'm willing to entertain putting it back on the agenda. So if if someone feels like we should, if something transpires publicly or whatever that that you know, or some other idea comes across someone's mind, you know, uh, crystallizes their opinion about whether we as a board should take it and and want to bring that forward in some <coughs> either motion or, <coughs> or just uh, to some other way to to discuss that, I'm happy to put that on the agenda. So yes, you know how. <clears throat> tiresome I am about logistics and so the other question I have then and I, I appreciate you offering that to us in case whatever things do occur to us and we decide we do want to talk about it again but in addition to that what I'm trying to understand based on what I said earlier about our shared expectation at least amongst ourselves community may not agree with our shared expectations but our shared expectations as to what we're going to do what are our responsibilities do we perceive ourselves as our responsibilities outside of you know ethics issues and that's an open meeting law etc as to telling each other as to what's going on so for example is it are the responsibility of any of us to if we're going to put in a newspaper column or if we're going to start a blog or if we're going to get listed in an ad do i just want uh, i don't want anybody to feel blindsided in this five groups so that we don't have an issue among I'm sorry I'm leaving you out of this conversation but you're not in it is so that nobody feels m misunderstood associated with the five of us because we are working so effectively together are people expecting that particularly if this is not an agenda item right so if this was an ongoing agenda item then I'd say well if you write a letter to the paper then maybe you shouldn't say anything because then it's kind of like deliberation but if it's not an ongoing agenda item at this point and we're not planning to deliberate on this further then do we just FYI each other when we're doing things or do we just say hey if they see it they see it or uh, are we trying to keep what I'm trying to understand is are we trying to keep each other informed of what each other is doing individually Um, I was going to say something else, but my response to that is I think that we each have enough personal integrity and judgment to figure out how, how we will handle that with each other, whatever the actions are. You know, uh, Mr. Steinberg um, showed some courtesy in letting people know that he had a piece coming out, and I think we can each make that decision. What I wanted to say, it's I, I'm not about bringing it. I'm, um, I think it's settled for now, but just I wanted to use this opportunity very briefly to say, Everyone in town, every, every household has received the written document um, and has a lot of information. And I just really want to encourage people to read it and read the um, introduction, um, the position of the Charter Commission, and you know, there's a, um, other information in the document itself, and that each uh, person should be ready to vote and should become informed and, and form their own opinion. I mean, I, I'm happy um, to talk to people about the, the issues, but I really think it's up to each person to spend the time to form, you know, to have an informed opinion about what they think would be um, the best form of government. The, the, these things are being debated because they are debatable. There isn't one answer. Um, there's, there's valid opinions on all sides of this debate, and I, I would just want to encourage people to stay informed and keep an open mind and, don't, and come to a you know, kind of educated, informed decision and, and commit that they're ready to they'll participate and vote. There's, there's still way more co community conversation to be had and constructive debate across that spectrum of opinion. So. Sort of a little commercial 
Absolutely. It is an important vote. It's, it is one that will have significant impact regardless of how it turns out. Mm -hmm. um, you know, as we encourage people to vote all the time, obviously, um, for a lot of things, I mean, we have a lot of things that come to our ballots, you know, that are you know, financially important to people. We ask for overrides at times. We ask for um, other kinds of significant things. This is, is, is on a par with those as far as importance. Um, mm -hmm. It's not, you know, there, is, there are concrete consequences to this choice. And so people's informed uh, uh, vote is, is, you know, important to, to, uh, to, be, um, to be had. So it's important for people to do that research and, and figure out what they uh, hold, you know, uh, as, an, as uh, how they want their town to function from a governmental standpoint. Um, are there any other comments on this particular topic? If not, then we'll move on to our next one, which is the town manager goals review, progress report. And there was a memo in our packet to that effect, um, which hopefully you had an opportunity <coughs> to read over the weekend. <coughs> Mr. Bachman, do you want to yeah, so, through that a little bit? <laughs> um, when we were setting the goals last time, uh, I, you had suggested, and I thought this was a good idea, that we I update you on a more frequent basis. So. This is the first cut of the two month <laughs> update. Uh, and uh, after this, when, you, when I will update you next time, I'll highlight the things that are different so you don't have to plow through everything. Um, some of these things will be repetitive, but um, it's a good way for me to capture things that we're doing uh, around town um, and, and how they're matching up with your goals. Um, and then also what, you, what I anticipate coming forward with in the future, which is on the last page moving going forward. So um, if there are comments or suggestions, I'm open to them. Uh, I think I will suggest one thing. Mm -hmm. So on page three, under number four, under managing fiscal 18 year budget, yep. I think we're in the second line of the first bullet. I think that should say managing its fiscal 18 approved budget. Mm -hmm. I think it's just a sort of typographical, yep. that's good one. <laughs> really not that's a good one. Substantial thing, but it oh, does rather provide a right. clarity yeah. there. I think that's what you want. But anyway, some sort of nuts and bolts kind of thing. But questions or comments for the manager regarding this? I'm trying to think if I had any offhand. Just the uh, global comment that I really appreciated having the opportunity to um, read your review of all that has been accomplished so far in the year and um, I uh, thank you for your hard work as is shown in the document and um, the um, steps that have been taken towards uh, achieving goals that I think that you were very much consulted about and I think we're all we were all involved in developing in the public format but I really appreciated uh, this document um, and for what it what it communicates about what you've accomplished. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I, I often say this is, it's partly for us to sort of be reminded of, of things, but it's also, I think, it, it serves a really public purpose in sort of outlining sort of what kinds of things towns up, you know, mm -hmm. the town as a whole is up to, because I think it's, it, it, it's easy to not recognize that there's so much sort of going on. Mm -hmm. um, on a sort of day-to-day -day basis, these are not often things that sort of, you know, you put a new swath of blacktop down or you put up a new traffic light, that's pretty obvious that something's happened, but, but uh, many of these things are much more subtle in their, in their, uh, in their visibility, mm -hmm. um, but nonetheless are very important to us. And, and so it's great to get this, you know, sort of out into the public so they can see, um, you know, the great work that's getting done on our behalf. Yeah. Kind of echo that. I think it is. It is really helpful, and just appreciate the amount of work it takes just to stop what you are doing, which is gigantic, and write it all up. Um, I did have. I did, you know, highlight a few things. But um, when I got to page nine, the going forward, and I read that bullet bullet 
bulleted list. I thought that was really helpful. I'm, I'm assuming they're not necessarily in an order of priority, mm -hmm. but they're there. And I, my note from earlier today when I was reviewing this was yes, <coughs> yes to all, exclamation <coughs> mark, because I think this reflects um, not just what you've picked out as priorities, but things we've talked about. We've talked about this at our board retreat and trying to, you know, have the discipline to prioritize of, you know, there's more that we want to do and could do than is humanly possible um, with the people <coughs> and the resources we have. And so this is, is kind of pulling out things we've all identified collectively that we think needs work in the coming six mm -hmm. months. So I, I think that was uh, a good uh, summary of that. Any further comment from the board? Um, I actually just have one, you know, you had on, and, and again on page three, not to be stuck on page three, but there's an emerging issue. I saw how far you got, huh? <laughs> no, I got further than that. But I just happened to notice it again and wanted to ask the question. Uh, you're talking about under sanctuary communities and mm -hmm. the possibility of grant funds mm -hmm. uh, for police department. Um, and you were s suggesting oh, that we've re cool. received a word. Mm -hmm. Any expectation of when you might? Or will you just, we won't receive the funds on January 1st and that's how we'll know? Or Right, I mean, I think it's, the chief has, has a good relationship with the executive office of um, public safety and, you know, the last time I spoke <coughs> with him, he did not have uh, insight into <coughs> if, if funds would be released or not. We're sort of, we're basically operating under the assumption they won't be, so, because he uses this to support his budget and so, he has to be taking steps now um, to uh, manage that over the course of six months. And I guess this subsequent question, which is, you know, in some ways not ours to hold, but um, sort of what actions might we take or be partner with other communities to take uh, regarding this? I mean, you know, there's, mm -hmm. there's some things that, you know, the state's attorney generals mm -hmm. kind of get together and, and take action sometimes if they feel mm -hmm. they're being sort of, you know, un unjustly sort of uh, selected or, you know, singled out and, and denied certain things. So I didn't know if, if you knew of what's on the horizon there in a broad sense. Yeah, you know, it will be a really important question for the town because it's one of these things where do we want to create a high profile response to this or do we want to follow sort of our legislative delegation, say this is unfortunate, or do we want to bring lawsuit? You know, there are law firms out there who have reached out to us out of New York and other places who said, if you have a cause, we'd like to, part of our mission as a law firm is to take these things, make make cases out of these things at pro bono. They, would, they were looking for opportunities like this. And whether that's something I've been, I've shied away from that at this, you know, in the, in the past, just because there weren't any sort of consequences. If this grant doesn't come through, it'll be the first real consequence to our adopting the sanctuary community uh, bylaw. And at that point, I wonder if we, I mean, that would be a d discussion we would want to have, whether we want to um, take a high profile on this and make it a, a more uh, public position on uh, being proud of where we, uh, what we've take, uh, the position we've taken and the law that we've passed and um, the consequences and why that's unfair. Um, but I, you know, I think the attorney general, we for, are fortunate to have an attorney general who's pretty active on this area. Uh, and until we know for sure one way or the other, then I don't think it's relevant. But I think that would be a conversation we certainly have to have is whether that's something, because it will reflect the town and you would be responsible for saying we want to do this or we don't want to do this. Just, I, when it's the right time, I look forward to having that conversation be, because I think it's an, an important one. And, mm -hmm. you know, there's, there's a lot of facets, as you just pointed out, but I think I wouldn't, I, if, once we do know for sure, I wouldn't want to wait too long to have the conversation. Right. So, right. You know, I'm assuming you'll bring it to us. <coughs> <coughs> Any other questions or comments for the, for the manager, Mr. Wall? Totally minor, but since we're doing this, mm -hmm. on, on page eight, we were talking about our community partners with the five colleges. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, it's good, of course, to hear that you've established relationships with Amherst and Hampshire, which have been basically lacking in previous years. But I had one question about point number two. It says, 
improved communications among our institutional partners has enabled the town to not be surprised by developments such as the university's RFI. However, since the RFI was issued, we have not heard much of substance and so forth. This has been disappointing. Does that mean we were not surprised by the RFI? <laughs> or we've not been surprised since the RFI? And um, what do we do about the lack of subsequent communication? Yeah, whatever. So this is, this is an interesting topic. <coughs> um, we weren't surprised that an RFI was going out. Once the RFI hit the streets, it's been pretty um, quiet coming from University uh, UMass Amherst. They, um, we actually uh, had a meeting with the um, chancellor today and we talked about this and Good. they um, did two things. One is they recognize, they want us to recognize that this is something at the UMass Building Authority, which is a separate entity that's driving this. But also, um, they left the claim that for us. Yeah, uh, they also said that they, it's a very, it's, it's a, and they actually educated us a little bit about, they're working in a very complicated environment where they have um, a lot of on-campus constituent groups who they are also being, and we're, we're one of the groups, um, because as they start looking at all these different things, there are lots of moving parts. And I think they were just asking us to be sensitive that um, just, and this has been really relevant to me as we've been talking about health insurance because we're doing lot, dealing with a lot of collective bargaining groups and trying to manage expectations and communication. Um, they felt like they had on-campus groups that they had not communicated as, uh, with on some, certain things and they didn't want to put us out in front of any of those groups. And that was actually, we walked out of that, that meeting thinking, oh, that make, I understand a little bit better. We still want them to be better communicators on this, but um, they're working in a fairly complex environment dealing with the state legislature, the UMass um, overall uh, um, offices, the president's office, and then also on campus. And if they are saying we're gonna, we wanna put this thing here, it all, you know, everybody sort of can get upset and say so they're hesitant to get out there too far on some of these things. That's the explanation they used for us. Can I ask you, Mr. Bockelman, because when I read this, um, it's kind of, uh, kind of a forceful statement and I made a note about, well, you know, then, you know, talk to our partners, which you've done, if you might want to think about tempering this statement, because this can get seized on by people and used in a way, and it sounds like you became more informed, and I might suggest, since this is a public document, that, mm -hmm. and maybe want to leave it the way it is, but um, I, I think well, this becomes sort of an, when they said be sensitive, this can be also so, sort of sure. used. In, uh, so this, this is written December 14th. No, and that's why I'm asking so you, the, that's why I'm asking December 18th, question. we have a different, I have yeah. more information. Yeah. So this is a time, you know, right. so I would, I would write that differently if it were to write it today. But you're, you're happy leaving it that way, okay. It's, it's what it is, yeah. No, I know that. It's, <laughs> it is public, but it's also we also revise documents yeah. when they become. Sure. And this will get revised the next time I present it yeah. to you. All right. so. Just asking the question. Exactly. That's when I think it gets revised. Yeah. Is that, wow, then that's new. Yeah. Is that's good that we've learned more about that since then that give, makes us more sensitive to the issue. Although people are still mad that sure. they want more. <laughs> so, you know, it still doesn't really right, solve the it, problem. Mm -hmm. We just understand it but better. It sometimes fuels a fire that's already burning, maybe for good reason. Are there further comments? So, not hearing any. Um, I suggest we move on to committee board appointments and reappointments, which we have one of. And so if someone would like to make the motion. Somebody else do it. This is the uh, mm -hmm. historic number five. District. You, you want to make that? No. No, go ahead. Because <laughs> you don't have it? Or? Yeah, right. All right. All right. Um, I move to appoint Maureen Adams to the local historic district commission through June 30th, 2019. Second. And there's a second. Is there further discussion or any explanation that wants to go with this? Hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? That's unanimous. All right, so now we'll go into section seven, which has licenses, public way, and metered parking reservation. We have a consent calendar, which we plucked one piece out of. Um, so, if someone would like to 
Make a motion, or or are there any items within that that need to be pulled out? For well, we did reason? pull one out. We so did pull I, one out, so it would so be. So I amended. think that what I had rewritten it as is I moved to approve the items listed on the consent calendar for December 18, 2017, as presented, except for item 3D. Mm -hmm. Is there a second? There is. Uh, any further discussion on these? Hearing none. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed. I, I am not opposed. I did not raise my <laughs> hand for that. It's unanimous, but I just you have want to a make comment. A comment. Yeah, yep. If if you would ask Ms. Puppel if she hasn't already, and I'll bet she has, but just in case she didn't get a chance, if she would add that earlier opening time for Big Guy to our list of uh, our liquor license quota report, she has been carrying forward on our liquor license quota report which ones are opening earlier, and we know that it's just a thing they tell us we don't get to choose exactly. whether they do it or not like but she's track. been keeping track of which ones are opening Good. then yeah okay. thank you so she probably already did it mm -hmm. good reminder in all the rushing with all these licenses at the last minute they do a great job it's they did a great job this year and um mm -hmm. both deborah and jennifer have done spectacular work on this this year they've worked very well together great that's great to hear so next up is a is a topic we took up a while ago, but I think we're going to uh, finish up tonight. Um, and that's uh, under the alteration of premises. I think we just oh. have, we got some additional refined and updated information <coughs> on a particular page within the application mm -hmm. from the applicant, which they brought to us the night we spoke to them before, uh, but they more formally sort of brought that to us around uh, uh, number of people, square footage, et cetera, et cetera. Storage story spaces in that and the like. Um, Can I ask yes. a question about that? So um, <laughs> I'm not going to bother explaining it for the folks at home if they weren't paying attention last time, too bad, um, is that I don't think the motion actually scans in a way that makes sense to me. Okay. And so for future reference, I wonder if we might fix that a little because I think I understand what it was trying to say, but it doesn't actually make sense. So to say, what it currently says is into the adjacent space at 35 East Pleasant Street for a total of 2,667 square feet, not including 530 square feet for the patio deck, which would imply that we are not licensing the patio deck, mm -hmm. which we mm -hmm. are licensing, mm -hmm. assuming that the building commissioner and everything else does that. Right. So are they saying with an additional 530 square feet for the patio deck? I what, think that's probably the better way the to right say it. What's the right phrasing there? Because we are, that is absolutely what we have to do. We have to do both inside so and outside. So delete the words not including in. What I would suggest there for someone who might make a motion is Somebody we're a total of 2,667 2, square feet inside, inside and 530 square feet for the patio deck with one entrance, three exits. Okay. Perhaps that works for everyone. Square feet inside and 530 square feet. That works. I could read that and we can mm -hmm. see if it works. Please do. Um, I move to approve the application of the Spoke LLC doing business as the Spoke for the alteration of premises for license 03114-RS-0024 for the expansion of the premises into the adjacent space at 35 East Pleasant Street for a total of 2,667 square feet inside and 530 square feet for the patio slash deck with one entrance, three exits, and proposed seating capacity of 97 and occupancy of 180. Shadow work member manager. Is there a second? There is. Is there further discussion or questions? A little bit on syntax, it looks like the patio has one entrance and three exits. Can we put, is there a way to fix it with a comma or something? Hmm. I'm sorry, are you I saying what the you're interior saying. doesn't have three exits? Well, it well, does, but it does. it's just the order of the sentence. Right. The, the way to fix that would be to take like, that whole width and extend the clause comma and after, move that. How about a comma after the word deck? That's what I thought you were saying. Yeah, like something, because it implies it's the it's how she read patio it. that has the exits. <laughs> it's actually the indoor space. I think that... However, so I think <laughs> <it's> whatever, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> fix it, it's fine. We know what we mean. No. 
So long as it's clear we're licensing the patio as well. I'm right. <coughs> Is there further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? That's unanimous as well. So next up is the uh, Hartford Half Marathon 2018, 2018 Request for Road Closures. And I believe we actually have some materials in our packet from, mm -hmm. from the folks from the uh, Hartford Marathon Foundation, uh, et cetera. So um, Mr. Bachman, do you want to give us a little framing of this? Sure. Um, so as you recall, the very first uh, Amherst Half Marathon uh, happened on uh, Veterans Day weekend, uh, and it was very successful. Um, and they did not exactly hit the targeted number of runners, um, but they do find that this community is a very receptive community to uh, road races, and they want to make this race one of a um, trifecta of races in three different states, uh, Connecticut, Rhode Island, and Massachusetts, and this would be one of them. They're before you early because they would like to start advertising that this is one of the three races that they want to um, host, three half marathons. And I think the logic of that is that many people come January 1, make New Year's resolutions to say, let's do this and let's run these three races over these, this period of time. They had suggested um, another, a different date, not the um, Memorial Day weekend uh, this time. Veterans Day weekend, yes, thank you. Um, and um, so they were looking, because that weekend, I believe, is a, um, there's an event at Amherst College that they wanted to uh, avoid, so they moved it a week earlier uh, to November 4th. Um, so. so. So I guess the, the um, the one complaint I've heard is that they that the donation that they made to the survival center wasn't as um, as generous as they thought that as many people felt like this um, company, which is it is a company that puts on these races, uh, could provide to the to the survival center. The survival center was grateful for the donation. It's uh, they would not have had this money had they not offered it. Um, there are people who run other races in town who. Um, generate a lot more money for a lot smaller races and they felt that wow they're coming in they could do a lot better and um you know with your if you um so i don't think that it says a monetary donation i mean that's something that i would want to push on um in terms of how much they're giving out of their each um registration that's exactly what I was going to say, is if there was some way we could phrase this to say, show us some more money, because yep. that, that's not enough yep. for, the, for these types of races. And the, we appreciate that it was their first year and they were figuring it out, but they can do much better than that. And um, I would want, I wouldn't want you to feel like you were in the position of, well, they approved it, so I guess if they say 36 is the best we can do, it's the best we can do. I would say no, I think they can do better than that. Um, I would suggest we defer action. I understand they want to get their stuff out, but I think if we defer action, it gives the manager some uh, leverage to have the conversation. And I don't think the difference between now and January 9th or in mid-January is that critical. I know they want it, but um, I think it's more meaningful to leave the negotiation open. That's fine. Do they need this one? So, given that they would like to put it on their list and they can't, if well, I mean they <coughs> could, they could put it on as a tentative, right. obviously on their list, um, and so that could be their solution to it. And then, like you say, you need some more um, mm -hmm. leverage to have the conversation, but. How much direction do we want to give the manager at this point in terms of when he brings it back to us? Because I mean, he's got a thousand other things to do. So, um, just in terms of what our expectation is and what seems reasonable to you. I, mean, I think they'll be anxious to do this, and it's mm -hmm. you know the economic development director has been the main intermediary between the two. Mm -hmm. So, they need us. Come back with something. So what I'm saying is, are we going to talk about it again in January? Oh, yeah. Gonna, yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, I think it's likely if we don't if we don't take action this evening that 
you know, hopefully we can on the 8th when we come back. Oh, that's useful. I mean, I think that's, you know, that's, I mean, we want to be, you know, uh, um, understanding of their, their need to get their marketing materials out, and that benefits us as well, and so it gives us a greater opportunity to, to, to generate you mm -hmm. know, food donations mm -hmm. and that sort of thing. Um, yeah, the certainly, deal. I mean, I think we should also, you know, encourage them to encourage their participants to stay in Amherst proper and go to dinner in Amherst proper, and if they mm -hmm. can work with the chamber or the bid or whomever to, to you know, sort of actively uh, promote some of the local businesses as a part of it, that would be great. Obviously, a, a greater financial donation to the to the survival center would be uh, um, additionally fantastic mm -hmm. as well. So. The flesh. I think all those things could okay. be beneficial to us so as, as our side of the You're family. inclined to approve it if the circumstances are right, basically. Yeah. Okay, We've that's good to know. Feedback from our constituents that they, right. for, this, for year number two, that they could do a little right. better. Okay, great. Thank you. All right. So, we have remaining on our agenda. Um, some minutes, which we may want to do, because they won't, shouldn't take long. Mr. We have the town manager's report and the select board member reports, and I know I have a member report. I'm sure some others have as well. Um, so why don't we do? Why don't we take up the minutes? Um, did the clerk wish to mention anything to us about them? Although I think we all got copies. Yeah, I think of them. they're. I think that they're quick and they're short enough that you could probably have read them by now. <laughs> uh, so I move to approve the minutes of the December 11, 2017 oh, yes. select board meeting as written is there a second second is there discussion hearing none all those in favor please say aye aye, aye. opposed abstaining we'll take that as unanimous all right so next up is the manager's report so okay. Bachman, what sure. do you want to share with us tonight? um so i just have a few things i want to update you on uh next time you get a full written report the um, uh, Ms. Aldridge already updated you on the North Amherst fire station. The boiler um, failed. We had to um, do emergency procurement procedures with the state in order to purchase a new boiler. Um, it, in it involved removing the old boiler, which was original to the building. And oddly enough, we had it on our capital improvement list for um, not this year, but next year because a year ago, Ron Bahanowitz had estimated, oh, you can get two or three more years out of it. He was off by a year. Um, and that sort of shows how tight he has, he's, how accurate he's been. And to be off one year on a 47-year-old boiler is pretty good. Um, but it did have asbestos in it, so we had to have remediation uh, company come in and remediate the asbestos and disassemble the boiler because it was installed in place and then other equipment was put in it couldn't just be picked up and moved out so uh, made it more complicated um, I think I updated you that the, the fire chief uh, secured a lot of other material to make sure that the um, bays were kept warm and it, it worked out fine so everybody worked together we appreciate um, Anthony Delaney our procurement officer Rob Mora um, our building commissioner who sort of headed this up and um, the uh, fire chief and the assistant fire chief Lynn Lindsay, who did a lot of work on this as well. Um, sticking with um, public safety, I interviewed six um, sergeants who are vying to become uh, lieutenants in the um, police department uh, to replace Jerry Millar, who retired. And uh, they, it, the thing that uh, we haven't made any decisions on that yet, but the thing that strikes me is that there are six really well-qualified you know, leaders in that department who are all very capable of stepping up and to become lieutenants. Um, one of the dangers for us is that they are, we only have so many slots and they may seek other employment because they, we are, we are a, a real incubator for strong leaders. So um, that's the dangers, but we'll pick the best and they'll be very excited. And it's, it's just encouraging to hear them talk about working for the town of Amherst and the pride they take to be part of this department in particular. It's really terrific. Um, we, um, the uh, uh, good news, bad news story. The good news is that um, we there's we were told there to be in Holyoke tomorrow morning at 9:30 for a important announcement on 
uh, funding for an affordable housing project, which we're looking forward to hearing about what that is. Um, the bad news story is that our application for mass works was not approved and um, that just means that um, we'll, we're going to communicate with the uh, funding agency to determine um, what we could do to make the, the um, application better. What they basically said to us is that we weren't generating enough jobs. MassWorks is a job creation program. Therefore, you have to, if you want to strengthen your application, you have to create more jobs. And we'll have to go back to the drawing board on that one. Um, uh, couple other things. Um, we had the uh, town's annual employee party at the Red Barn on Friday afternoon, three o'clock, and uh, Ms. Kruger was there representing the board, and we had members of the personnel board there. It was a really good turnout, really great venue. People were in high spirits, and um, it was good. We do this, we do something in the summer, we do something in, in, around this time of year, and it was really, people were really buzzed about it for some reason um, this morning uh, because they felt like it was one of the better ones that we've had for a long Best time. Venue. Yeah, it was a great venue and people were really positive and things so. Um, Mr. Bachman, I just said for people who are watching, the employees pay yes. for the party and manage the whole thing. It's not. Yeah, so it's it's 100% employee paid. Um, there's a tradition that I learned is that department has kick in extra money <laughs> to help pay for it and then employees are held, their, their contributions held pretty low. Um, so, uh, yeah, not a dime of town funds goes into that. Um, the um, it was a lot of fun. It was good, yeah. Uh, Miss Brewer's uh, necklace would have fit in. Oh, with some of the that would other have been modest. <laughs> yes, yes, I should hope so. <laughs> um, I mentioned that I had um, we had a meeting with um, the chancellor at UMass today and. Uh, with the two teams and um, talked a lot of, about a lot of different items um, in terms of uh, uh, relations between the university uh, and, and the town uh, preparing you know I'm identifying the, the uh, renewal of the strategic partnership agreement which is not until 2019 but we want to start thinking about that because we know budgets get set in advance um, alerted him to some things that we see on our side asked them in they're alerting us to some things on their side. Generally, there's really good communication between the university and the town right now. I think uh, we have a couple levels with uh, Tony Morales and um, Nancy Buffon over there talking with Jeff and with Dave Zomack. There's a lot of back and forth and they, they call each other a lot to keep everybody apprised of what's going on. So I think the communication is at a very high level for almost anything that happens. Um, and they're, you know, so it's really helpful for us to know what's going on over there. There are some things that we can get better, which we've talked about already. And, um, you know, it's helpful to start thinking about what we see as, it, it, the challenge for us is that we don't have a clear vision of what we want our downtown to be moment. You know, we have the master plan, but it's, you know, this, these, these sort of planning sessions are supposed to be helping us uh, be more clear. Uh, the university, on the other hand, has a broader mandate. They look at the town, but they also look at all of Western Massachusetts. You know, they have a Springfield connection, and they see themselves as a major, and they have very, they're very ambitious about their major footprint that they want to have on the region, um, and how they're co they see their competitors as um, Cambridge and Boston, and that's that's, and they want to create an equal weight out here. And it's it's a ambitious agenda. I think this, the chancellor is very smart about how he's gone about that. But it's just great. We agreed that we would have another meeting um, immediately after the charter vote um, so we could understand what happened and what that means for the university and for the town and just to stay in better communication. So uncertainty creates um, nervousness and we want to allay, allay any of that. Um, there's not a whole lot that will happen between now and then, but it's, it's just good to have had that conversation. Um, the North Amherst Library, we're moving forward with the RFP on that. That was supposed to go out last week, but um, our procurement officer got sidetracked on a lot of work on the North Amherst <coughs> fire station, and then he was out for training. So that we are scheduled to look at the documents tomorrow. So our goal is to get an RFP out before Christmas. Um, we'll, our time frame will still be around the same, same, same time. Um, 
what else? Um, Winterfest is coming up. That's you know you probably got something in the mail about that or something February third of a week coming forward. Um, the there's a community solar meeting coming up um, on January 9th um, at 6:30 here in this room. So as people want to talk about what's going on with the solar project on the one of the landfills. Um, <laughs> the newer landfill. The newer landfill. Old uh, landfill. The new old landfill. <laughs> it's the old, old so, landfill. Yeah, the old new landfill. <laughs> and then the um, other thing I wanted to mention was the uh, Craig's Doors uh, loss of funding and that might be on your agenda too to bring up. So that's something for the board. We've been asked to um, write a letter to the legislature and I think that was happened last year. Ms. Brewer wrote a letter um, on behalf of the board. So whether you want to do that again or not is up for question. So I'll just preface or, or piggyback on that a little bit. Um, the Municipal Affordable Housing Trust at the meeting on last Thursday did uh, um, vote to send a letter. Um, I believe copies got sent to us as, as a board or maybe Mr. Hornick just shared some proposed text we did in a letter. It. I can't remember if it was just addressed to me or if it was addressed to the group as a whole. I don't think so, yeah. Um, but I can certainly share that out. It, it articulates sort of, you know, how Craig's Doors works and what role it serves in our community. And uh, I think it was very similar to the letter from a year ago. And so the, the Affordable Housing Trust um, sent the letter, thought it would be wise for all of us to, to, to you know, the select board and, and other, you know, concerned parties within town to, to send similar letters uh, to the governor and and copies to the legislative representatives, et cetera. Um, and so one thing is whether or not uh, I'm, I'm certainly happy to do it. I think it can be beneficial. I don't know if it will have the impact it might have had last year just because I'm not sure the governor from, from West Bachman's reported whether or not the governor is amenable to releasing any of those those sorts of funds um, at this point. The, the, the really critical thing is, you know, if even if he releases it, but he releases it in April, mm -hmm. that doesn't do us much good. Um, so it's really a matter of uh, timing's a critical piece with regard to this. Um, it is money that has been budgeted. Theoretically, there's revenue resources available to to send it out. So uh, I think we can, we are within our right to sort of press for that release of funds. So I'm certainly happy to take uh, on the task of, of composing a letter on our behalf if that's amenable to the to the group, and I will share that out before it goes out, um, and obviously take edits individually from each of you. So if that's okay with with the board as a whole, I'll do that because um, I think it is worth our time, and and it is a um, you know a valuable resource within our community to help those folks that are without uh, without resources to provide housing for themselves. So I think it's worth with our effort. Um, so I'll take that on. Um, did anyone have questions for the manager on other points of, or things that he mentioned? Yes. I didn't get a chance because I was looking up the remote participation part <laughs> about the, um, yes, that will be a recurring theme for the rest of the meeting tonight, is the, <laughs> the little trailer, the Amherst Media feed. Um, is associated with the community meeting on solar. Has that been added to the news and announcements part of the website? Because if it hasn't, I think that would be a really good idea. In fact, I was disappointed that the select board wasn't on the initial mailing list for that because we should be so that we can be reminding people. So when they say, hey, what have you heard about that? It's like, bing, we forward that email and say, right. here it is. Um, I appreciate that BCC was used. That was very clever. But um, the select board was not on the initial announcement of that January 9th meeting. And we got it from Mr. Bachman, oh, but we didn't get it from staff. Yeah. And so um, we should be added to that email list. But also, if it's, in the, if it's not in the news and announcements, I know it's, we're about to move into the holidays. Mm -hmm. But so if they want to wait and do it like right after the first. Well, I, I can guarantee you people know about it. There are neighborhood listservs that have this yes. already. Well, but, and, but I think it's and, important that the entire community know that it's right. happening, not just the right. people who feel directly impacted yes. right. because it's not Everyone just a neighborhood has thing. A stake in this issue. Right. Right. That's a nice way of so, putting it. So as an abutter, I know that I've received a postcard oh, relative to the fact that there was a meeting on the 9th. You got a postcard from? This. I got that one right there. Nice. 
Very nice. Yeah, this is the this is we didn't realize it was postcard, but we yeah. saw this as the attachment that you yeah. sent us. Yeah, excellent. So I got one because I'm like I said, I'm going to butter and not mm -hmm. <laughs> not because I was a select board member. I don't think. Um, <laughs> right. Which you know, of course, Jade's my view. <laughs> <laughs> no, but it is it is a community wide thing because it does you know as we talk about uh, both with actions at, at last town meeting specifically you know the resolution relative to you know, renewables and also the net zero energy uh, that sort of raises the importance of pursuing this or, or looking at this as, as an option for the town. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's. I'm, I'm, I put it in my calendar and be able to go to it and other members because I'm interested in it. Right. End of town, you're not as, quite as close as you are. Right, right. Now that, now that we're on to the new, <laughs> the new old landfill, the the, the uh, transfer station, yeah, yes. is is much closer the to my property. The other, but. The other one is. So, if there aren't other questions or comments for the manager, I would turn to our, the members for their own reports. And so, I know Mr. Steinberg had something because he only he hinted at it without yes. actually giving any details. So. Uh, the other thing I, um, for, for the DAC, we'll come back to the other issue at some future date. Um, <laughs> is uh, they also talked about um, the loss of bus route 43B and their interest and concerns about that. And um, I happened to notice that this evening, they, um, the chair of DAC sent the select board and the town manager a uh, memorandum about the uh, concerns of the DAC on that issue. Um, Can I address that just so yes. Party? So that is was an initiative of the Department of Transportation, <coughs> not by PV, PVTA. Mm -hmm. uh, Department of Transportation um, is looking how looking at Route Nine, that Route Nine corridor between Northampton and Amherst, and how to speed traffic. Um, their logic was if we get more people out of cars and onto express buses or buses that move faster. Uh, if buses move faster, people will take them more likely take them, and there people fewer people will be in cars. Uh, so they did this on their own um, with little, with no consultation with towns, um, did not understand, for instance, that we have our ambulances serving, you know, making 5,000 runs to uh, Cooley Dickinson on that road um, for some reason. And then the chair and I were at a PVTA meeting last Monday and brought it up with the head of the PVTA, and she basically was saying, um, we've given them and given the Department of Transportation information but um we're not necessarily recommending this f from the pvta's point of view and they would ha they have a very extensive process so um and now the department of transportation has gotten enough flack where they're sort of pulling back and saying we may not have had all the information we needed to make these recommendations so i think getting a lot of f feedback from people um has been very beneficial well i'll let the chairs the dac chairs let her stand for itself yes so I just want to add one other quick little item regarding that. So, so the PVTA process, anytime they change a route of a significant nature, there's a formal process they go through. Some of that is federally regulated. It's not even state regulation with regard to how they do that. Some of that's federally regulated about impacts on community that's influenced. So, so they have a real process they're going to have to go through. I'm not sure to what extent or whether it was a factor for the mass stop planning that was going on at that point. And, and it may not have been necessary to have it as part of their factors uh, at the time they were uh, uh, thinking about that. Um, but I think that they also, you know, there were some other, um, you know, items of, uh, that they were operating in a bit of isolation, I guess would be the simplest way or maybe the fairest way to describe it, not understanding that, like, we're on an academic calendar. And so, you know, trying to take a survey, they'd send out, you know, a request for, for people to fill out a survey, but they'd send it out in the middle of December for, a, you know, relatively late December feedback and it's like well you know all the students are out of town and when they before they leave town they're all taking finals surveys about buses aren't first on their agenda so so understanding that understanding how we serve uh, you know area communities and go up and down that corridor for EMS service uh, is another area <coughs> where I think that they were not <coughs> they were not or are not aware of how that operates and so uh, impacts of some of the choices they're they're thinking about are going to be pretty profound to, on us and our ability to provide that service so I think you know they're they're gonna have to kind of climb the learning curve a little bit i mean i think we're all appreciative of their desire to improve traffic on, in that corridor um but at the same time they they they're hopefully getting enough 
feedback that, that they understand that they're going to have to do a little deeper dive on some of the nuances of how it works um, so that we can get it right. Anyway, so that's all I'm going to say about that for I now. Exactly. Right. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Just completely took over. Yeah. All right. So the other two committees that I wanted to report on really, you know, I'll try and be as quick as I can. Um, I did go to the inaugural meeting of the Regional School District Planning Committee and um, the committee that was appointed by the moderator, Peter Demling, who was elected as chair by at that first organizational meeting, Joan Temkin, who had served many years ago in a previous um, regional school district planning um, effort in Mary Lou Talman. And uh, I, uh, they, it was just an opening discussion on their part. Um, as uh, Ms. Brewer reported at a pre previous meeting of this board, um, she and I had served previously both on the prior Regional School District Planning uh, Committee and Planning Board. I um, offered to be of whatever assistance that I could to them, and I also said that um, the Select Board does have a continuing interest in what they're doing and um, while we don't have an officially designated liaison that for the time being that they're welcome to treat me as liaison and let me know and I would appreciate receiving any communications from them. So um, in the third meeting that I attended is the most recent meeting of the Community Preservation Act Committee and uh, I think there's been some reference already that Mr. Bachelman has made in some of the written material that he's presented. But um, they are underway for the season. They have received their proposals. Um, one of the things that I think has always been a little bit of a misunderstanding in difficult relationship as a result is the relationship between the Affordable Housing Trust and the um, Community Preservation Act Committee and um, uh, Mr. Hornick, his chair uh, of the um, Affordable Housing Trust came and made an excellent presentation in explaining the differences between the roles and um, therefore um, uh, really kind of created a dialogue that hasn't existed before and I thought that that was very helpful um, in general terms. Um, there were 14 new proposals in addition to nine continuing obligations from prior votes that we've taken where there was um, bonded um, items that then get funded over a period of years. And the total, I believe, is 1 million, if I'm not reading my writing, I think it's $1,938,988. Um, that includes an amount um, well, then, but there's only $1,630,214 available, which includes $375,000 that was reserved for community housing in a prior uh, town meeting vote. So it's a carryover amount. So um, that's, um, we'll present them with the need, as always, to make some difficult choices on what they are going to recommend. Would like to go next. Um, I'd mentioned in, the, in recent meetings that there had been some confusion or controversy about the building inspector's handling of uh, what was considered a demolition request, which was being sent to the Historical Commission, and it was causing some puzzlement on the part of the Historical Commission, on the part of homeowners and contractors and so forth. And so planning director Chris Brestrup and building inspector Rob Moore came to the Historical Commission last week, had a very productive conversation. And then we had a conversation this morning, uh, those parties, the chair of the commission, I was there and Mr. Zomek, and further tried to discuss ways to move forward. So I think we're all in agreement that things used to be simpler and somehow got complicated and we're trying to find a way to make them simpler again. And that's, that'll be, in part just in understanding what everybody wants, but there'll also be some long plan changes underway to clean up the bylaw a little bit to make the language clearer and, and fix the rules and regs. And we expect that Ms. Prestrup, Mr. Moore, will attend the historical commission meeting 
in January also for a follow-up. So that's very good news that you know, everybody is on the same side and has goodwill and is intelligent, so it's, it seems soluble. And then just to pick up on CPA, the, the, the dog park task force has, has a sort of placeholder CPA proposal, and, and so it's been shopping that around to Conservation Commission and so forth uh, on the assumption that land purchase might be necessary. I'll leave it at that for now. Um, I just I just will report on the personnel committee personnel board. Um, there were two meetings um, back to back uh, last Wednesday. Um, and I think um, Mr. Bakum, were you at the first one, which was a the um, was a um, chance for the personnel board to hear from the non-union staff and this happens annually and um, the the main topic was a presentation of the proposed changes for the personnel uh, policy procedures document I don't know if I have the rights. Um, and so they uh, there's a pretty good discussion back and forth and people had found certain things that were like new language you know that wasn't clear or what about this and made some really good points and then that meeting adjourned and the personnel board met um, to discuss that feedback and decide what they wanted to go ahead with whether they would make a change or not make a change and they discussed a few things mostly um, I'm not going to go into the substance but they will be coming the personnel board will be presenting to the select board, and I, now I forget if it's Janu January 22nd. That's what I remember. Yes, January 22nd. So, um, it most most of it is not our um, purview, but it's kind of a, it's a courtesy. And then there's some things that have to do with dollars that I think we do need to hear about more formally. So um, I, I wasn't quite clear about what was ours and what was not ours, but. In any event, they very much want the select board to see the work um, and the changes and have that presentation and you know, have our um, involvement in that way. So um, they're, the personnel board is pretty excited that they've, it's a, it's a huge task. There was an employee um, working group that worked on it, like I think it's been about a year and people have taken it really seriously and I think made vast improvements in the um, procedures personal procedures that we now have. I mean, so I was just modernizing, like, you know, laws have changed. But part of the overall idea was to have the tone of the document be um, more welcoming and not sort of chastising, if you do this, then this will happen. Um, just, just sort of a carryover. So I think we've heard some of that already here in our kind of interim, but I just, I'm looking at my calendar and that's pretty much the only thing I have to report. Or did you have anything you um, want to share with us? You're watching me make this long list to go, really? Oh, <laughs> How short can you be? So Hampshire County Select Boards Association, some of you might have remembered we sort of thought about doing a December event, which is when the annual meeting is supposed to happen, and according to the bylaws, yeah, and no, that's not happening. So we are struggling to figure out how to keep that organization afloat. So any ideas, please feel free to send them towards your vice president of Hampshire County Select Boards Association, being me, since I guess if we don't ever have an annual meeting, then I guess we don't have an election, so I guess I stay vice <laughs> president for a while longer thank you to Nancy Talbot for being president and to the other members one from Pelham and one from Cummington who are trying to figure out how to make continue our relevance but in a busy world it's difficult to figure out how to do that um, speaking of things that that are kind of in fits and starts the state if you'll recall in its wisdom had an alcohol working group under Deb Goldberg's Treasurer's mm -hmm. Department, mm -hmm. and um, it had many members. They had a hearing in, in Northampton that I attended, got myself put on a, uh, they're called the working group, whatever, doesn't matter. 
task force, and there are several task forces. A couple of other local people have been on the other task forces, and in fact, I guess some of them are going to be reporting out to the Campus and Community Coalition in March. And um, hopefully by then, we'll know something about what we did in September when I followed up with the member of the task force who had been my chair of my working group. She was saying they were hoping by the end of the year they'd have a final report, but the reason you haven't seen anything is because there hasn't been anything to see. This is a very different process than something that's very visible, like Cannabis Control Commission. This has been very small uh, very small in comparison. But it's possible that something that the Alcohol Task Force comes up with as recommendations may influence what we do associated with our alcohol policy. So maybe our timing will be perfect. We'll see. But um, we haven't heard anything yet, and I wouldn't expect to hear anything any next minute. Um, in terms of one item that might be on your desk like mine tonight is we usually try and have a table at the Martin Luther King breakfast. Now, I mean table two different ways. One is Ms. Radway and Ms. Pupp will always arrange for a place for us to sit to have <laughs> breakfast. That's one kind of table. And the other kind of table is the tabling in the hallway where I have this theory every year that I'm going to recruit more people to committees. But I don't have any pretty pictures to like draw them in like Big Brothers Big Sisters does. So if you want to stand around at a table and talk to people about the zoning bylaw and committees, we, we can do that again on January 13th. And then shortly after that is MMA. It's always that week. Are we all going is my question. And then my, so, and so. Then my comment associated with that is probably you might not want to volunteer to judge the annual reports if you were ever asked. <laughs> Because it turns out to be a really complex and long task. There were lots of choices. And so, yeah, that was wicked time consuming, but super interesting. I was like, do I get to keep these so I could like look at them and, and you know, learn more things about stuff? So it's very interesting. And in fact, I thought I was going to bring them back tonight, but I didn't. So I have them to get, I, they, they need to somehow possibly get back to Boston, but I'm not taking them with me in January. I don't know. I don't know if they need the copy. Well, they need one to put out on the table. I'm sure they spent oh, three. They yeah. Spare. So at any rate, I worked with another judge in another community, and that, that was really interesting, who was actually um, also a representative on the Mass Selectmen's Association. So that was really, that was um, good times. And the Community Development Block Grant Advisory Committee is working hard at this point in time is when there is their busiest time. You've seen meeting notices, their community development strategy, and oops, they're about to lose quorum again. So they don't even, they only have three members as of their next meeting out of seven. So we have, um, we have a problem. And it's complicated because so many people who are interested in block grant are interested in the social services aspect, which of course is tiny money in comparison to the money we spend on capital. But the tiny money that we spend on social services, so many people who are interested are either already serving on a board or working for one of those organizations. And so there's an obvious conflict. And so you can't put those people on CBBG advisory. So if you find somebody who's retired from a board but hasn't joined another one yet, great. But um, encouraging the community to consider if you're not serving on a board or working for one of those agencies right now, and it's a very interesting process, and it's time limited, and so it's something that you can say, hey, I made an impact, I informed the town manager, we have a process, and then you can stop doing it for several months at a time. Um, that would be really helpful, but unfortunately, they're headed into their busy season, and they're about to lose quorum. So that's something to think about as you were going around talking to our community members. All set? Yeah. Okay. So I just have two things. One is I'm going to sort of add on to you know the uh, the comments I made about a, a municipal housing trust uh, meeting last week. I informed you they they wrote a letter um, relative to the Craig stores. Um, we had a they had a pretty robust conversation around the property disposition policy, and I would suggest that they have a tremendous urgency around that topic. Uh, I think there's some 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 things that uh, they would like to pursue. Um, and so having having that policy in place would be very very helpful to them. So I think it behooves us to to move along with that. Um, with the deadlines, though. Yeah, because we're one way or another, it's going to come up. Um, so if we have a policy in place, it, it mm -hmm. serves us all better, I think. Um, second thing, just to touch base on the PVTA meeting that Mr. Bachman and I went to was a legislators' meeting. So we came and. Several legislators from Western Mass that are in member communities were there. It was mostly to inform them about the nature of the budget situation for PVTA as, as they can sort of read the tea leaves. It's much like our circumstance in October. Um, they're looking at uh, 
what what they foresee as the uh, the potential sort of state aid that they're going to get, and and it looks like it's going to be a very tough budget year for them, and they wanted to uh, get the legislature you know on board and aware of you know the issues that they face, and then also you know work with them to to advocate for more funding for all the regional transit authorities, not just their own, but all of them uh, will be struggling with with tough budgets as a result of that. Um, so it was productive, and then of course we met afterwards to talk about. Uh, the mass up project that involves the B43, and so we got a little clarity on on some timelines and sort of how they were fitting into that process at this point. Um, the only other thing I have is that I wrote out to the membership of the BCG to inform them that we will meet at 8:30 on the 4th of January, um, and so we will begin our coordinating of the budget on that day, and so we'll we'll get some. Uh, uh, you know, beginning conversations regarding regarding the struggles we're going to have with fiscal 19 and getting you know the revenues and expenses to match up. Um, and at this point, I think that's that's all I had. So if there are yes, Mr. Uh, there was that one additional piece of business. Please, um, we received um, a letter from uh, the chair of the bicentennial committee of the town of Amherst. New York on Friday and um, for those of you who are not familiar Amherst is a suburb of Buffalo and is home of the State University of New York at Buffalo so that they also are home to a big state university um, also had the delight of uh, about a year ago, staying at a motel in, that happened to be in Amherst and turning on the television and finding on the community channel the opportunity to watch their council meeting. <laughs> I said, that was a way to start a vacation. What can I say? But in any event, um, they are celebrating their 200th anniversary, and they're trying to get 200 greetings from, um, to, uh, um, for J January 2nd when they start off their um, bicentennial event. Um, and uh, just of greetings and congratulations kinds of things. So um, I think that uh, it would be a nice thing to do as a uh, fellow um, community that's a town of Amherst, uh, only pronounced slightly differently and home to a major state university. So I'll make a motion, and if somebody seconds it, fine, and if not, so be it. I move to authorize the chair to issue a resolution or another form of congratulations to the town of Amherst, New York, in recognition of its 200th anniversary. Second. So we have a motion and a second. Is there further discussion? I love the some other form. We need to save that word <laughs> for something we do in the future. It's in the pie. <laughs> well, I want, to, I want to give full discretion to the... <laughs> a postcard. Good luck. <laughs> so, Another 200 years. You know. <laughs> That's awesome. I, I was thinking in my mind, oh, they're like a sister city. And you were saying fellow, and it's just like... 30 years. Yeah, you know, they, they're both right, but like... They're, Gender so, thing. What can you say? <laughs> Maybe we can fit in a little bit there about like getting, you know, mail to the wrong place. Right. Every once in a while, you do really get confused with one of the other Amherst. That's true. It has um, yes, indeed. If there's not further discussion on that, then uh, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? That's unanimous. So I will craft something in the next few days, among other crafting of letters. So unless there is any other business, then I move to motion. adjourn. Move to adjourn. Second. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 And we're adjourned at 10.09.